We're live. Good morning. Would all sergeants please start their recordings at this time? Recording to the clouds, all set. Sergeant Lugo, just give me a thumbs up. Thank you. Good morning. Would all sergeants please start their recordings at this time? Good morning and welcome to today's joint New York City Council hearing on the committees of health and the Committee on Hospital. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification. Once again, would all panelists please turn on their videos for verification. To disminimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc. Dot gov. Thank you so much for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant, and good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee, and I'm thrilled to be co-chairing this hearing with my colleague, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, who chairs the Hospital Committee. And I want to welcome fellow Council Members Ampri Samuel, Barron, Cohen, Holden, Levin, Powers, and Rosenthal. It is sometimes said that a vaccine doesn't stop a pandemic, it's vaccination which does. So today we're holding an oversight hearing on New York City's plan to administer the COVID-19 vaccine in this city of over 8 million people. This hearing is taking place at a perilous moment as the second COVID wave is crashing down hard on our city. Cases, positivity, hospitalizations are all rising fast. Each of us has much, much more work to do to flatten this new curve in the months ahead. And the exciting developments we're discussing today do not change that, but they are truly exciting developments. Science has done something mind boggling, gone from the first gene sequence of this virus to delivery of a vaccine in just over 11 months. To everyone in the scientific community who worked around the clock to make this possible, thank you. New York State expects a first delivery of 117, excuse me, 170,000 doses of the, Pfizer of the Pfizer vaccine on December 15th in just 11 days. Later this month, New York expects to receive additional allocations of both the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. There really is hope on the horizon. But vaccination will be by far the most complicated undertaking of this pandemic, dwarfing the challenges we faced so far, for example, in testing. And they're not just logistical and scientific questions to tackle, but moral questions as well. Key among them is the question of how we'll prioritize distribution of this vaccine. There's broad agreement that we'll start with healthcare workers, then those who live and work in congregate settings, and then essential workers more broadly. But how we define each category has huge implications. Healthcare workers, for example, should include not just physicians and nurses, but every COVID facing staff person, including those who clean the rooms of COVID patients or serve as translators for COVID patients. Congregate settings should include not just nursing homes, but jails and homeless shelters where we know the risk of spread is extremely high. Essential workers should include not just first responders and those who work on infrastructure, but also New Yorkers who deliver food or work in supermarkets, laundromats or restaurants. A successful vac vaccination program must also require that we focus intently on building confidence in the public about the vaccine, in part by maintaining complete transparency throughout the process. This will be doubly challenging in African-American and other communities of color where justifiable mistrust has built up over generations of racism and neglect in the medical system. In a pandemic which has been defined by inequality, let's do this right. Let's ensure our vaccination program actually advances equity and leaves no New Yorker behind. Lives depend on it. 
I want to thank the administration, including the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Health and Hospitals, for all of their work throughout this pandemic and for joining us today. I also want to thank Pfizer for being here today. We're excited to hear your testimony. And I want to thank the incredible staff of the Health and Hospitals Committees, Councils Harbani Ahuja and Sara Liss, Policy Analyst Emily Balkin, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt and John Cheng, Data Team Rachel Alexandros and Julia Friedenberg, and my own Legislative Director, Amy Slattery. Thanks again to all of you for joining us today. I look forward to this discussion. And now I'd like to turn it to Chair Rivera for her opening. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the City Council Committee on Hospitals. I'd like to start off by thanking my co-chair, Council Member Mark Levine, for holding this important hearing today. This morning, we're holding an oversight hearing on the COVID-19 vaccine. As we all know, by April of this year, New York City and its communities was the epicenter of the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic with more cases than many countries. This ongoing pandemic has unfortunately been the deadliest disaster in the history of New York City as we have lost more than 19,600 New Yorkers to this virus. And as we now enter the 10th month of the COVID-19 pandemic in New York City with winter looming, we are now once again seeing an increase in cases across our city. It is important that we as a city continue to follow the direction of our public health experts and continue to wear masks, practice social distancing, and avoid indoor gatherings when possible. I know folks have pandemic fatigue, but we have gotten through the worst of this crisis together as a city, and we can save lives by continuing to follow public health guidelines. On a positive note, we can see a light at the end of the tunnel. Multiple vaccines have been developed and two, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are on track to soon be approved by the FDA. But before we can envision returning to some semblance of normalcy in our city, perhaps in the next year, we must ensure that the city and state are well equipped to handle the distribution of vaccines for our residents. Providing over 16 million vaccination doses to New Yorkers will be an extremely complex an unprecedented logistical challenge. This includes prioritizing vaccine distribution, procuring necessary supplies and equipment, coordinating vaccine distribution and delivery, preparing for administration of the vaccine through various vaccination sites, supporting and expanding data and information technology infrastructure, engaging in public education and community engagement regarding the vaccination program, and post-vaccination monitoring. This will be an incredible lift for our government, our health department, our hospitals, and other vaccine providers. The state and the city have already issued plans for their COVID-19 vaccination programs, and we look forward to hearing more about those plans today, including updates on what is already underway. We also look forward to hearing more about how equity will be a focus of the plans for distribution and what challenges the city faces in distribution and administration of the vaccine. I wanna take a moment to commend DOHMH and h, h who are present today for their incredible work throughout this pandemic to keep New Yorkers safe and healthy. It is through the efforts of their staff that we were able to significantly decrease the infection rate in our city. And we look forward to hearing how they will be coordinating to distribute and administer the COVID-19 vaccines to New Yorkers. Thanks to the administration for your work and for being here today. I also wanna to thank the staff of the Hospitals and Health Committee, Councils Harbani Ahuja and Zara Liss, Policy Analyst Emily Balkin, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt and John Chang, and Data Team Rachel Alexandrov and Julia Fredenberg for all their work in preparing for this hearing. And of course, my own Legislative Director, Jeremy Unger. I look forward to today's important discussion and I thank you and everyone for being here and for their testimony in advance. And now I'll pass it back to Chair Levine. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera. I'd like to welcome two additional colleagues. We have Council Member Alan Mazel and very excited, we have Council Member Dharma Diaz. This may be her first hearing 
I'm not sure, but we are thrilled to have you here with us as well. And I'm going to now turn it over to our moderator, senior policy analyst, Emily Balkin, who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing and call on our first panel of witnesses. Thank you, Chair Levine and Chair Rivera. I am Emily Balkin, the Senior Policy Analyst to the Committee on Health and the Committee on Hospitals of the New York City Council, and I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I want to go over a few procedural matters. I will call on panelists to testify. I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify, and then you will be unmuted by a host. Please listen for your name to be called. For everyone testifying today, Please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. I will be periodically announcing the next panelists. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Here to testify is Dr. Dave Choksi, the Commissioner of New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And here for Q&A from the administration are Dr. Jane Zucker, the Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Immunization, Dr. Andrew Wallach, Ambulatory Care Chief Medical Officer at h, &H as well as the Chief Medical Officer of the New York City Test and Trace Corps, and Dr. Lee Fiber, the Senior Assistant Vice President of business operations at New York City h, h I will now administer the oath to the administration. Commissioner, Commissioner Choksky, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before the committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Dr. Zucker, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before the committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Dr. Wallach, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before the committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. And Dr. Fibert, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before the committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Um, we are now ready to begin. So Commissioner Choksi, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, Chairs Levine and Rivera and members of the committees. Uh, I'm Dr. Dave Choksi, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and provide an update on the city's plan for distribution of COVID-19 vaccine to New Yorkers. As you heard, I am joined today by my health department colleague, Dr. Jane Zucker, who serves as Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Immunization. Dr. Andrew Wallach, Ambulatory Care Chief Medical Officer at New York City Health and Hospitals and Chief Medical Officer of the NYC Test and Trace Corps, and Dr. Lee Fibert, Senior Assistant Vice President for Business Operations at New York City Health and Hospitals. Local health departments play a critical role in vaccinating the public against communicable diseases, and the New York City Health Department has long held expertise in vaccination efforts. In 1947, we led the first citywide vaccination campaign, the effort to eradicate smallpox and establish the foundational infrastructure needed for mass vaccination that still exists today. Over the years, our agency has adapted our vaccination efforts for everything from seasonal influenza to the routine immunization of children and adults against diseases such as hepatitis A and B, measles, mumps, rubella, HPV, and chickenpox to emerging threats like H1N1 and now COVID-19. The department's expert immunization team works year round to increase New Yorkers access to vaccination services with a focus on equity and reducing disparities. It is an everyday miracle that New Yorkers regularly receive vaccinations and are protected against disease and public health threats that some time ago were simply not preventable. It is with this foundational expertise that the health department has approached the unprecedented vaccination planning effort for both seasonal influenza and COVID-19 this year. We began planning for both this spring, knowing that the COVID-19 virus would still be spreading during influenza season 
it was more critical than ever to increase our seasonal influenza vaccination numbers. To achieve these historic vaccination rates, the health department launched a citywide campaign to encourage New Yorkers to get their flu shot and has worked with partners to expand vaccine activities across the city. As our media campaign says, this year's flu vaccine could be the most important one you ever get. And New Yorkers have answered our call. To date, we have seen a remarkable increase in flu vaccination coverage among New Yorkers. From July through the end of November, there was a 35% increase in the number of adults who received the vaccine compared to the same period last year, and a 7% increase for children. We are working with New York City Health and Hospitals, community health centers, community-based organizations, urgent care centers, and are offering flu vaccine at several COVID-19 testing sites as well. The health department also launched a new program this year to deploy teams of community vaccinators throughout the city to meet New Yorkers where they are, including at pop-up vaccination events, pharmacies, and houses of worship. This work will continue throughout the coming months as we reach peak influenza season. It's never too late to get your flu shot. Simultaneously, the health department has been hyper-focused on preparing for a COVID-19 vaccine. We've been working with our state and federal partners to prepare for phased and equitable distribution. Once available widely, vaccines can be one of our most critical tools in preventing the spread of COVID-19. Preliminary information from the vaccine manufacturers suggests that at least two vaccines will likely be available in the United States soon. Both will require two doses and preliminary studies have indicated that they are safe. I will be upfront. These are new vaccines for a new disease and there's still a lot that we do not know, such as when there will be authorization by the Food and Drug Administration, how long protection lasts, and how often people will need to get vaccinated. But we remain optimistic that a vaccine may be authorized and become available as soon as mid-December. After a vaccine is authorized, it will be distributed in phases to groups of people based on their risk of COVID-19 exposure and severity of illness if exposed. While these phase designations are still being determined by federal and state governments, the first category of people to receive the vaccine will likely be high-risk healthcare workers, as well as staff and residents of long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes. High-risk healthcare workers include those who are taking care of COVID-19 patients, such as emergency department and intensive care unit clinicians, or non-clinical staff working in areas of a facility where there are COVID-19 patients. Distributing to these individuals first will help reduce the burden of transmission and mortality and will ensure the protection of our critical healthcare workforce as they continue to treat patients infected with the virus. We expect initial allocation of vaccine to be made available as early as December 15th and to be distributed initially to hospitals throughout the city who have capacity for ultra cold storage, which is required for the Pfizer vaccine. High-risk hospital staff will receive vaccines from this initial distribution. The health department is prepared to stand up and operate temporary sites exclusively for vaccination of emergency medical services or EMS personnel who will also be included in the first few weeks of vaccination. Additionally, the Centers for Disease Control is operating a program in partnership with pharmacies to bring vaccination to long-term care facilities throughout the country. Through this program, providers from CVS and Walgreens will bring vaccine and needed supplies to long-term care facilities in order to vaccinate both residents and staff. We are working with New York State to align on a start date for this program, which also depends on the vaccine allocation for New York City. The vaccine will likely next be available to essential workers who interact with the public and are not able to physically distance, followed by people at high risk of complications from COVID-19 because of their age or underlying medical conditions. <laughs> Once there are enough vaccine doses available for widespread distribution, doses will be made available to all New Yorkers, though this will likely not be until mid-2021 depending on supply and availability.
The health department has been working closely with healthcare providers in New York City to prepare for a forthcoming vaccine distribution. This has included sharing information on what we know about vaccine trials, timelines, and anticipated logistics for a campaign. We are also enrolling healthcare providers in the citywide immunization registry, which allows the health department to track doses and vaccinations across healthcare providers within the city. We are additionally prepared to launch sites across the city in coordination with our emergency response partner agencies to offer vaccinations, ensuring access and availability citywide. The COVID-19 vaccination effort will be the largest in the city's history. As we receive more information from the federal government, the health department continues to plan for vaccine distribution building on the department's existing infrastructure and incorporating lessons learned from H1N1, last year's measles outbreak and annual flu vaccination programs. The staff working on this effort bring a range of expertise to the team, including vaccine distribution, allocation and accountability, healthcare provider and public communications, community partner engagement, congregate setting support, healthcare system support and field operations. We're also coordinating across the entire administration, working closely with our sister agencies and the mayor's office to leverage all of the city's resources. As is the case across our work, our COVID-19 vaccination planning is rooted in evidence and equity and informed by individuals and advocates from the many communities we serve. Behind the scenes, we have been working steadily over the past several months to enhance innovate and reinforce the robust infrastructure for vaccine distribution in New York City in order to ensure that it is ready to safely serve all New Yorkers. This includes working with healthcare providers and pharmacies to enroll them in the citywide immunization registry, making sure they have completed the federally required CDC provider agreement and providing technical assistance for storage and handling capacity across hospitals. We will deploy the vaccine through these channels. So it is vital that providers and other partners have both the resources and information they need and have a trusted relationship with the health department. In addition to gathering vital information needed to prepare logistics for distribution, we recently conducted a successful end-to-end -end delivery test in partnership with the CDC and Bronx Care. We're also actively assessing New Yorkers willingness to receive a COVID-19 vaccine, reasons for wanting or not wanting to be vaccinated and preferred places for vaccination. These insights inform our distribution planning with providers and facilities and will help shape our outreach and messaging related to the vaccine. It is more important now than ever that government be transparent, equitable, and ensure reach of information and resources to all communities. We have learned this lesson through decades of public health experience, but the past 10 months has further transformed how government must communicate with the public. To put it plainly, we need New Yorkers to trust us. Trust is an essential ingredient of turning a vaccine into a vaccination. But this begins with ensuring that we are worthy of the public's trust. In some communities, specifically the Black community, this trust will be hard won due to decades of systemic racism. It will be challenging and we will need the support of community partners in order to be successful. Listening to community input and welcoming collaboration will be central to our understanding of where New Yorkers believe vaccination should occur, whom New Yorkers trust to share vaccine information and how vaccines should be distributed. We plan to leverage our existing mechanisms for community collaboration, such as our health opinion polls, our community advisory boards, and a New York Academy of Medicine public deliberation, and are establishing additional partnerships with community-based leaders and organizations in neighborhoods that experience greater barriers to vaccination. Within our agency, we have developed a vaccine equity plan focused on addressing equitable access uptake and outcomes to guide our work in the coming months. Furthermore, the health department is committed to reaching New Yorkers in multiple languages and in ways that will most effectively deliver 
a trustworthy and relevant message about the safety and value of this vaccine. We recently launched our COVID-19 vaccine webpage, which we will keep updated with the latest information about vaccine approvals and distribution. This will include transparent and credible communication about the phase distribution of vaccines, where and when vaccinations will be available to New Yorkers, and which New Yorkers will be eligible to receive vaccinations during each phase. And in the coming weeks and months, we will launch citywide media campaigns across multiple platforms to deliver these messages. We will adjust our communication strategies based on feedback from our partners and the public and as new information becomes available. New Yorkers have become more familiar with key public health terms this year, percent positivity, epidemiological curves, incidence rates. So I will take this moment to explain yet another core public health concept, the difference between individual and population impact with regard to vaccine. When vaccination begins for these priority groups of people, it will have an individual benefit meaning the vaccine will reduce the risk of those individuals becoming infected if exposed. Only in later months of broader distribution, if sufficient numbers of people get vaccinated, will we likely begin to see the population level benefits of the vaccine, such as significant reductions in community transmission and protection of those who cannot get vaccinated due to a medical condition. While the vaccine is a light at the end of the tunnel, it will be important for New Yorkers to continue to follow prevention strategies to stop the spread of COVID-19, even once a vaccine becomes available and even after they themselves have been vaccinated. I implore all New Yorkers to remain vigilant and continue using the prevention tools that we all have on hand, staying home if sick or exposed to someone with COVID-19, practicing hand hygiene, wearing a face covering, and keeping physical distance from others. These simple strategies, in combination with testing and contact tracing, enable us to control transmission of COVID-19 in our communities, flatten the curve, and protect ourselves and our loved ones. I wanna sincerely thank Chairs Rivera and Levine for holding this hearing today and for being truly committed partners in the effort to stop the spread of COVID-19. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And thank you to the women and men of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene who have proven again that, that you are the best big city health department in the world. And uh, we're just grateful for your efforts over the last 10 months. And uh, it's particularly exciting to have Dr. Zucker here who I think can be considered one of the national experts on vaccination, um, and we thank we thank her for taking time to come speak to us today. I understand that there. Uh, excuse me. Let me pause and, rec and recognize some additional council members who joined us. Excuse me. Don't want to neglect that. Um, so we have uh, council members uh, Moya and Reynoso are also with us. Um, I understand that much about the timeline ahead is still uncertain. Uh, but to the extent that you can even give us general estimates, um, we're expecting a mid-December shipment of the first batch. I presume that that will focus uh, primarily and maybe exclusively on COVID-facing healthcare workers. Is that right? Or even at that point in mid-December, will uh, nursing home residents and staff be included? Thank you for the question, Councilmember Levine. Um, so yes, you're right about uh, the contours of the timeline. We expect the first shift, shipment to um, be received in New York City uh, sometime the week of December 14th. That will likely be um, the Pfizer vaccine uh, at that point in time. And the first uh, part uh, of the first phase that will be prioritized, which is known as phase 1A, um, is for high-risk healthcare workers and residents and staff of long-term care facilities. Um, the precise ordering within that phase is something that uh, the state um, will provide additional guidance on uh, in the coming days. And there's one other piece of this that's important to understand with respect to the timing, which is that for long-term care uh, facility residents and staff, 
Um, that is done in coordination with the Federal Centers for Disease Control, which is standing up uh, the program to vaccinate those residents and staff. Uh, and so there is a, a contingency uh, based on when, uh, when that program will be able to roll out as well. Will the city receive shipments directly or will they all go through the state? Um, we are partnering uh, with the CDC with respect to ordering and making sure that the shipments go uh, to city uh, healthcare providers um, and other places where a vaccine will be distributed. So the citywide immunization registry is where those orders are cataloged. Um, they are then brought to uh, the CDC, placed into the CDC's system, um, and the CDC determines how a uh, vaccine is then distributed to the various points of access within New York City. We're doing this all in complete and close partnership with New York State um, because, uh, uh, because uh, that partnership is vital, particularly with respect to ensuring that we follow their prioritization guidance, um, but also so that we coordinate with them on their own plans uh, with respect to um, how the vaccine rollout will go across the rest of New York State. Will the staff that is prioritized in healthcare facilities and nursing homes in phase 1A include not just medical personnel, um, but also people who work in housekeeping, um, translation, uh, security, uh, cafeterias, and others who are clearly in contact with COVID patients and are doing a great service and are at risk? Yes, well, first, thank you for asking this very important question. You know, as someone who has taken care of patients in clinics and hospitals uh, as a doctor, I will be the first uh, person to tell you that there is no way that patients uh, would get good care were it not for the support of all of that non-clinical staff, including, um, you know, the specific roles that you have mentioned. Uh, and so many of them uh, have uh, been helping uh, with the care of COVID-19 patients over the last few months. Uh, so we are um, working with uh, New York State um, with respect to uh, the prioritization of high-risk healthcare workers and exactly what that will encompass. I'll give you a few, uh, you know, sort of principles with respect to um, who will be prioritized. First, um, staff who do work directly with COVID-19 patients, as, um, as we've discussed, uh, particularly in higher risk settings like emergency departments and intensive care units, but also people who uh, are um, providing direct services in areas where there are COVID-19 patients, um, cleaning staff, uh, people who may be uh, handling uh, deceased bodies, uh, transport services, um, those are, are part of, of the uh, draft guidance as well. Also staff who perform procedures where there's higher risk of what's known as aerosolization, uh, which is um, you know, particularly um, uh, increasing of the risk of transmission. So for example, anesthesiologists who place a breathing tube uh, into a patient who needs assistance uh, to breathe. Um, also, uh, staff who have uh, exposure to patients or the public in a way that may increase um, the risk of transmission, including staff um, who are in close contact with patients who are at greater risk of morbidity or mortality um, if they're exposed. So those are some of the ways in which um, we're thinking about uh, high-risk healthcare workers that goes beyond uh, direct clinical staff. I believe that what you're referring to phase 1B is the broader universe of essential workers. Uh, is that correct? And when do you expect those individuals to start to receive vaccines? Yes, if you'll allow me to um, just take one step back um, with respect to describing the phases. Um, there are three phases as determined by um, the federal government. Uh, these three phases are determined based on the relationship between supply and demand of the vaccine. So in the first phase, this is when we know there will be quite limited supply and demand will exceed uh, that supply. The second phase is when uh, supply starts to catch up to demand um, and we'll see an evening out and an ability to broaden out the number of people who are able to get vaccinated. And then the third phase is when we have sufficient supply 
and we'll be able to vaccinate the general public. So then um, to your question, Chair Levine, uh, with respect to that first phase, that is then further broken down into uh, categories. Um, the first is phase 1A, which we've already talked about, high-risk healthcare workers and residents and staff of long-term care facilities. Um, the next uh, categories of that first phase are still being finalized, um, both at the federal level and then that will have to involve discussion at the state level as well. But the contours that have been discussed thus far would involve essential workers in phase 1B, so that's the second part of the first phase, um, and then people who are at greater risk uh, of COVID-19 and particularly greater risk of severe outcomes from COVID-19 in the uh, part known as phase 1C. So that includes our seniors, uh, as well as um, other New Yorkers who have underlying medical conditions. And you can't speculate on the timing of phases 1B and C at this point? Commissioner. Uh, forgive me, I muted myself. No um, uh, it is difficult to know precisely what the timing of those phases will be because it is so contingent on supply. We expect phase 1A will last uh, at least for a few weeks, um, and we hope to move into the other parts of phase one uh, by uh, sometime in January or February. Similarly, I think it's important that we correctly define the world of essential workers to include um, not just uh, first responders and people who work on infrastructure, obviously extremely important, but um, all those who have been out there serving and putting themselves at risk throughout this crisis, people who work in supermarkets, uh, doing food delivery, who work in laundromats, restaurants, um, are, are, has the city uh, confirmed that those important occupations will also be included in, excuse me, in phase 1B? Um, this is another uh, important point, you know, with respect to um, how we think about essential workers. Uh, and the short answer is uh, that, yes, we're thinking both about people who uh, have kept our essential services, you know, running over these last few months, um, but also incorporating uh, both a lens of risk, meaning you know, who is at uh, greatest risk through their occupation, particularly if they're not able to physically distance, um, and also uh, taking into account an equity lens, uh, because we know that risk of exposure has not been borne equally in certain places or among uh, certain um, race and uh, ethnicity groups. So along those lines, um, we know that congregate settings are extremely dangerous, and that's why we're prioritizing nursing homes but we know there's a great risk of spread in jails, uh, in homeless shelters. And in fact, there have been uh, an alarmingly high number of cases in one jail facility, a federal facility in Brooklyn, the Metropolitan House of Detention. I think just in the last three days, there's been 55 positive cases. It's quite worrisome. Uh, will those facilities also be prioritized along with nursing homes? Yes, yeah, so congregate settings beyond uh, long-term care facilities uh, have also been uh, discussed uh, at the federal level um, in terms of the prioritization framework for phase one. Uh, and certainly, you know, the areas where there is greater risk, um, that includes uh, prisons and jails, um, it includes uh, homeless shelters, uh, and, and certain other congregate settings as well, uh, will be part of the prioritization um, for phase one. Can you say anything about the plan for vaccination of young people, of children, and whether you expect there to be a vaccination requirement at some point for children uh, to return to school? Yes, well, let me start by, um, by making sure that we convey uh, with respect to the two vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, um, neither uh, has been uh, uh, sufficiently tested in children as yet. So both, um, both vaccines uh, do include uh, children between the ages of, of 12 and 18. They are starting to enroll in the trials for those vaccines, but we have not yet seen the outcome data with respect to efficacy and safety uh, for uh, people under the age of 18. 
So we have to follow the science there and wait for it to emerge, you know, with respect to, uh, to the data. Um, we will certainly be following that closely. And I do hope that at some point in uh, 2021, we will have at least one safe and effective vaccine for children uh, as well. Um, but I think it's premature to talk about, uh, you know, anything like a vaccination requirement until uh, we have that safe and effective vaccine. Similarly, uh, individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities, do we know yet whether the vaccines are considered safe and effective for this group? And many of them also live in congregate settings. And so I'm wondering if there's a plan to deploy the vaccine as a high priority in those locations. Um, yes, uh, and again, you know, I, I hope uh, that we do have a safe and effective vaccine across all of those different uh, groups. We have to wait and see the details with respect to um, the trial participants, uh, you know, the people who are in the studies for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which um, will be publicly posted in the coming days. There were 44,000 uh, participants in the Pfizer study and about 30,000 participants in the Moderna study. Once we have uh, those more uh, detailed results, we'll be able to speak more to the questions that you are posing. But congregate settings of, of all types you know, will be a part of the prioritization. Uh, a question that, that we're often asked is, do you think that people who have the antibody should or will get the vaccine? Is that even a factor that should be considered? Yes, it's another important question. Um, the current uh, guidance from the CDC is that uh, whether or not um, you have a certain antibody status uh, is, is immaterial to uh, getting the vaccine or not. And specifically, there is no recommendation to get an antibody test before you get the vaccine. Understood. Will people be able to choose which vaccine they get? We have two and probably more options that will be publicly available. Um, yes, uh, this may be the case as supply increases. Uh, you know, we um, have to see exactly how much supply of the different vaccine there is um, and how uh, precisely it will be able to be rolled out, you know, through uh, certainly our city program in collaboration with hospitals and healthcare providers. Uh, but also um, through that CDC pharmacy partnership program as well. Uh, and so my hope is that in 2021, we will have both multiple vaccines, but also a sufficient supply uh, to be able to enable some of that decision-making. Thank you. And finally, before I pass it off to my co-chair, you mentioned in your opening statement that you're doing some assessment of vaccine confidence, which might be a survey. And you also mentioned you're developing an, ex an equity plan but we're happy to hear about both of those. Um, uh, at what point might those be publicly available? Um, thank you for asking about both. Um, I, I will start briefly and then I'll ask Dr. Zucker to say a bit more about both of them. Uh, the first is, um, you know, with respect to understanding uh, vaccine hesitancy, you know, vaccine skepticism, uh, these are uh, fundamentally important, you know, to, um, to inform our public communications and community engagement efforts. Um, we do it through what I refer to as the health opinion poll. Uh, this is a survey of New Yorkers that, you know, helps us understand um, attitudes uh, toward vaccination. Uh, but we also use many other channels, including our community advisory boards, um, to gather that input. Um, and then the second, the vaccine uh, equity plan um, that was mentioned uh, is something that uh, we wanna be able to take a holistic approach around um, access, uptake and outcomes uh, around uh, equity. Um, and that's something that we've been developing over the last uh, few weeks and months. And we will have more details um, to share about that in the coming days, uh, including publicly. But let me invite Dr. Zucker to say a little bit more. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so with the health uh, opinion poll, our preliminary results from October were that 53% of New Yorkers said that they would be willing to receive a vaccine. 20% uh, said they would not, and 20% 20 20 said they were not, and 27% that they were unsure. Um, what is really exciting is we will actually be repeating this poll next week to see whether or not as more information has become available about the vaccine that these numbers have changed. And what is of concern in uh, the initial 
responses is also that we do see the potential for inequities where, for example, a white New Yorkers responded that they would be more likely to get the vaccine than, than black New Yorkers. And so that's why it's critical as we um, implement our equity plan that we are really um, addressing the uh, racial disparities, we, we address mistrust, that we ensure that we have vaccine available really um, broadly geographically in priority neighborhoods um, and through sort of trusted facilities um, that are in those neighborhoods. Thank you. And has, has that data been shared publicly and could it be, uh, particularly with breakdowns by race? So we had presented it at uh, community meetings. And so, um, you know, I will, I will just take that back. I, that, um, you know, I'm in terms of how we can release that, uh, but we do have those summary PowerPoints. Thank you. Forgive me. Just one final question. The Times reported yesterday that there have been cyber attacks on companies and government agencies who are working on vaccine distribution. Do we know of any uh, targeting of, of entities in New York City uh, by cyber attacks? And, and how confident are you in the security of our system? Um, thank you for this question. It is something that we've been monitoring as well um, with respect to cybersecurity. Um, we have uh, uh, some dedicated cybersecurity efforts um, at the health department, uh, including um, taking uh, uh, you know, a hard look at uh, the citywide immunization registry uh, around that. Um, in general, uh, it is a very robust uh, system with respect to security and safety, and I will say also privacy and confidentiality, um, but it is something that we're actively monitoring. And we at least have not heard uh, from other uh, healthcare partners or hospitals about uh, cyber attacks in New York City. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chachki and Dr. Zucker. And now I'll pass it off to uh, my co-chair, uh, Chair Rivera. Thank you so much for your testimony. I will certainly be asking a few follow-up questions to um, what Chair Levine has asked, but I just want to start with how does the average can you describe how the average New Yorker is most likely to get their vaccine? And let's say it's the spring, it's the summer, um, we've really reached some of our priority populations, our essential workers, our most vulnerable individuals. Are they going to get it at a hospital, at a CVS? Will they need an appointment? Will it be some sort of walk-up service? Will insurance cards need to be provided? Uh, thank you for this important question and also for um, couching it in the timeline. You know, we do think that it will take several months uh, for the vaccine to be broadly available to the general public. But at that point in time, to your question, um, we want it to be available through as many channels of access as possible, but perhaps even more importantly, through the channels that New Yorkers um, already uh, trust and use, whether it's their local pharmacy, whether it's their primary care uh, doctor whom they've been seeing for many years, whether it's a hospital you know, where they've been cared for uh, and very much trust. Um, we will, particularly when we have sufficient supply, look to stand up additional points of access if it appears that that is necessary to be able to get as much um, of a safe and effective vaccine to New Yorkers as possible. And then finally, with respect to your question about um, insurance, vaccine will be available to all New Yorkers, um, regardless of insurance status, regardless of ability to pay, regardless of immigration status. Um, we will be working with partners across the city to operationalize that, and particularly with our colleagues at New York City Health and Hospitals. I'll ask you about health and hospitals in a minute. You mentioned in your testimony that you will launch sites across the city uh, to be able to administer the vaccine. Do you know how many and where? I know you're enrolling a massive amount of people in the citywide immunization registry, but do you have an idea of how many and where? Um, in short, we are planning for uh, different uh, scenarios um, because so much of it is dependent on the supply of vaccine um, from uh, you know, an initial phase where we stand up um, dozens of those types of access points 
to potentially standing up even more if that is required as supply increases. Um, you know, in that planning effort, we're also looking to complement um, areas where vaccine will already be accessible. Um, and particularly looking at our priority neighborhoods where we know from influenza vaccination and our other vaccine efforts um, that uh, there are sometimes not enough points of access. Uh, and so shoring that up through uh, the selection of sites. And I'll get to equity in a second, but let's go to the, the healthcare workers. How are you planning for any healthcare workers who might miss a day or two of work because of symptoms of the vaccine, such as low grade fevers? Yes, thank you for, for asking. This is an important question um, as we rely on our healthcare workers, as we see more uh, cases and hospitalizations at this moment. Um, you know, we do anticipate uh, that there will be some mild to moderate uh, side effects from uh, vaccination, and that may require um, some uh, people who are getting the vaccine to uh, stay home from work. Um, we have been in dialogue with our healthcare partners, um, including our hospital partners, to ensure that they're aware of this and are uh, baking it into their planning uh, with respect to making sure that uh, you know, the staff who are uh, vaccinated are phased and sequenced in a way that enables them to have continuity of operations. Will essential workers at public agencies be required to be vaccinated to return to work? And do you think, should all New Yorkers be required to be vaccinated? Um, the, the short answer to the question is, um, is no, at this point in time, um, I believe it is, uh, it's premature to talk about any requirements for vaccination. Um, we still have to follow the science with respect to, um, you know, understanding uh, what the FDA will authorize with respect to the specific vaccines. Uh, and then our immediate uh, and medium term priority will be uh, to get that safe and effective vaccine to as many New Yorkers who want it. And in terms of flexibility, I know that you mentioned making sure that we're getting the vaccine to congregate settings, but, um, and you mentioned uh, that the federal government is discussing other kind of high risk congregate care settings. What flexibility does New York City have to include places like Rikers or places that have supportive housing or that are housing those with developmental disabilities in, in phase 1B itself? Uh, well, this is very much on our mind, you know, with respect to uh, ensuring that um, places where, unfortunately, we have seen a uh, higher risk of infection and exposure uh, are part of um, the prioritization discussion, encompassing, you know, many of the places that uh, both you and Chair Levine have pointed out. Um, we uh, have brought that to uh, the dialogue where we are invited, both at the federal level um, and are in very close communication with our um, state counterparts as they elaborate the prioritization framework. So we do have opportunities to provide that input. And thanks to the feedback that we've gotten from the public and from our community partners, that has been uh, you know, a significant part of the input that we have provided. So how is the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene coordinating with health and hospitals and other New York City hospital systems in determining who will receive the first round of vaccines? Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to um, speak a little bit about uh, the very deep and tight collaboration that we have with New York City health and hospitals. Um, this has uh, been, as, as both you and, and Chair Levine pointed out, uh, some of the crux of our COVID-19 response to date, um, whether it has to do with taking care of of patients uh, to um, expanding access to testing. And I'm so grateful to health and hospitals for all of their efforts um, shoulder to shoulder with the health department uh, in bringing to bear all of the resources that we possibly can for New Yorkers. Um, looking ahead, and I'll invite Dr. Wallach to, um, uh, to uh, comment on this as well. Um, looking ahead, we want to make sure that um, health and hospitals is uh, a fundamental part of how we think about reaching New Yorkers, um, both the patients who already rely upon H&H, &H, uh, 
Um, as you may know, I'm, I'm a primary care doctor at, at uh, Bellevue uh, myself. Um, so people who have had trusted relationships with health and hospitals for, uh, for many years, um, but also thinking about the access points that health and hospitals, both hospitals and clinics and many of the other um, you know, test and trace core sites uh, as uh, critical parts of uh, our infrastructure for um, expanding access to the COVID-19 vaccine. And if you'll allow me, perhaps Dr. Wallet can uh, comment as well. And if I could just add just something to that is, will DOHMH provide guidance on identifying which personnel in healthcare settings will, will receive the first round of vaccines or will hospitals make their own individualized determinations about prioritizations amongst their own staff? Um, this is a, a dialogue. Um, it's a dialogue at, at two levels. Um, one is between uh, New York City and New York State uh, to make sure that we have unified guidance for hospitals and other healthcare facilities with respect to um, how prioritization should occur in the initial phases. Um, and then the second level is, is between us, the city, and specific healthcare facilities themselves. Um, we always wanna provide guidance that is rooted in science and equity, but we also want to allow those healthcare facilities to have some degree of flexibility to meet the needs of their own staff and the patients that they are serving. So, um, so that's how I would characterize it. Okay, I wasn't sure if anyone wanted to add anything. So let, let's move on to equity because um, you also mentioned in your testimony, trust by communities of color. And Dr. Zucker, you briefly mentioned, I believe the, the poll that was done by the Kaiser Family Foundation. And so that was a poll that found that two thirds of white people said they would definitely or probably get vaccinated compared to 60% of Hispanic adults and only 50% of black Americans. And so um, this leads back, of course, to the trust, um, I would say the mistrust that exists in these communities for many, many reasons, sterilizations, um, uh, you know, tests that just were really destroying our communities and whether it were Puerto Rican women or black Americans, um, there is a lot of history there that really speaks to why these statistics are what they are. In terms of equitable access, you know, what is kind of the rubric that you're using? What's the metric for success? You mentioned that you are using um, community-based organizations or community leaders to make sure that you're getting out some of this messaging, that language access is very important to you. Can, can we get a list of the community-based organizations you're working with to address messaging? We certainly wanna be helpful and we certainly have um, inroads with a lot of these organizations. And to just add to that, I wanted to, um, how are you gonna ensure that communities with historically less access to healthcare do not miss being vaccinated? Yes, um, well, thank you for the, you know, the thoughtful uh, comment and your uh, way of framing it um, really reflects the complexity of this. Um, you know, we have to be um, very clear eyed about uh, the unfortunate historical legacy um, that affects uh, trust in communities of color in New York City and you know around the rest of the country as well. Um, and we have to uh, acknowledge that, um, but also think about everything that we can do to address it. Um, and that's what our our vaccine equity plan is centered around. Um, you know, the way that I would uh, start by characterizing it is our um, our starting point is one of humility and recognizing that uh, there are institutions, uh, there are faith leaders, there are community-based organizations who have been uh, building up trust within communities for, uh, for years, and in some cases, generations. And our commitment as the health department is not just to get the right messages out and to work on our plans, uh, but to really partner uh, and have the reflex um, to say that it's about engagement of those institutions and community leaders uh, for our equity efforts. Um, we have uh, you know, a specific equity pillar in all of our planning efforts. 
Um, as you may know, uh, Dr. Torian Easterling uh, was, uh, I recently appointed as our first deputy commissioner and our inaugural chief equity officer. And he will be critically important to operationalizing that pillar as well. How will you monitor or use data collection to cross correct or to improve, evolve, um, build on some of this work and making sure that we are reaching these communities? Thank you. This is another uh, critically important point. Um, and our approach through the entire COVID-19 response has been to say data is the lifeblood of our response. Everything else, whether it's a policy decision or how we think about our operations uh, should be rooted in data. Uh, and that very same approach will be brought to our vaccination efforts. Um, we have the backbone through the citywide immunization registry to be able to monitor uh, distribution and uptake of the vaccine in close to real time. And based on that, we will be able to um, adjust and calibrate our efforts and make sure that it's matched up to our equity imperative. So my last just question about this, and I want to get back to H&H, &H, which is uh, Chair Levine mentioned that New York Times story, and there was a series of cyber attacks, right, aimed at some of the government organizations which are being vaccines. And, and so this has a, a lot to do with trust and the way that health information is the number one type of information that's hacked. And I, and I did a, a hearing along with council member Bob Holden, who's joined us today on, on this very topic. And are you working with the Department of Homeland Security? Have they been in touch with you? Is there, uh, I know that you say that there's a plan and, and you have things in place to secure information. Is there gonna be federal oversight on this? I, I know that this, there is federal state and local level implications in terms of coordination and collaboration. Has that already started? Is it underway? Um, thank you for the question. Yes, we are taking this very seriously. Um, I uh, will have to follow up with you with respect to you know, any specific conversations with the Department of Homeland Security or other uh, federal and state partners. Um, we do have uh, both our baseline uh, cybersecurity efforts, which um, are constantly monitoring for uh, for threats for our information systems, as well as a, a dedicated effort um, specifically around the citywide immunization registry and, uh, and our vaccination efforts as well. So in, in, inside of our health and hospitals, um, will hospital workers need appointments and insurance? I just wanna make sure that people understand where in hospitals will vaccines be administered and what will vaccine distribution look like on the ground inside of our health and hospitals facilities? Is it gonna look like the testing operational system we have in place now? Is it going to be different? And what is the plan for administering, administering the vaccine specifically to residents and staff at H&H's skilled nursing facilities? Um, I'd like to invite Dr. Andrew Wallach to comment on that. Great, thank you, Dr. Chakshi, and thank you, Chair uh, Rivera, for the question. Indeed, New York City Health and Hospitals has been preparing for quite some time over the past several months uh, in anticipation of receipt of uh, the vaccine, of which we're incredibly excited. We have outfitted each of our 11 acute facilities uh, with ultra-cold storage. Each of these freezers has the ability to store up to 140,000 doses uh, of the vaccine, so we are prepared uh, to receive. For our first phase, as Dr. Chokshi noted early in his testimony, we will be focusing on our uh, staff that are at risk uh, dealing with patients who are COVID-19 positive. We plan to follow our flu vaccine model uh, where we will have a centralized hub, if you will, at each of our 11 acute facilities. We will be scheduling appointments for our staff um, to come and get their COVID-19 vaccine. And again, one of the reasons why we are doing this, uh, again, to the point that Dr. Chokshi made earlier, is that should folks have side effects, we wanna make sure that our entire respiratory therapy department doesn't come on the same day um, and therefore uh, potentially have folks out of work the following day. So it will be by scheduled appointments. We are being very cognizant of staggering uh, different departments uh, on different days throughout the week. And to the extent possible, we are asking our staff 
to get their vaccine on the last day that they will be working during a week, uh, should they have any side effects and need to take some time off. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I guess this, this will be my last question because I see we have quite a few council members with their hands up and I, and I certainly appreciate that. Um, so I, I realize there is still a lot that we do not know. And I wanna thank you for being candid about that. We don't know when the vaccine will be authorized. We don't know how long it will last. We don't know how often it needs to be taken. And I appreciate you trying to answer all of these questions to the best of your ability. And, and sounds like to me, there is a, a lot still left to be discussed. And, and as a council, we'd certainly appreciate seeing these plans and procedures in writing. Will the city be releasing their own plans in writing again, or is the state releasing a follow-up to their 96-page plan? And how are you all coordinating on a plan of that magnitude? And again, will it be available in writing to the public? Um, thank you, and I'll start just by saying we are um, we are very committed to working uh, both with the council. Uh, as well as um, you know, so many other partners across the city and the state uh, on uh, what you pointed out, transparency. Um, I know how important it is to earn and be worthy of public trust at this moment. So even as we are um, following the science and following recommendations from the federal government um, and uh, you know, waiting for some of those things to unfold, um, our commitment is to communicate about them uh, as soon as we, uh, we understand advancements. With respect to the plan itself, um, yes, we have shared um, our, our plan on our website, um, you know, the one that was uh, originally um, developed in, in collaboration with the CDC. The state has its plan uh, as well. And um, our intent is to, to share information in a much more frequent basis as this continues to roll out. That will include both written documents, um, and we have some of that up on the website that I mentioned already, um, as well as uh, you know, briefings and, and hearings like this one, uh, and just quite a bit of saturation in different forums. I, I appreciate that. And I just, I'm sorry, one, one final question. This week, the governor, Governor Cuomo, and a broad range of advocacy organizations issued a letter to the US Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Secretary, um, Secretary Alex Azar, expressing concerns about the effect that the execution of data sharing agreements with states as a condition of participating in the vaccination program requiring identification of each vaccinated individual and permitting the sharing of identification data with other federal agencies, such as the Department of Homeland Security and Immigration and Customs Enforcement would have on the willingness of undocumented immigrants to participate. So what is the city's assessment of the concerns expressed in the letter? And what is the city's assessment of the remedies proposed in the letter? For example, for New York State to provide a system for tracking vaccinated individuals that does not identify to the federal government, the social security number, the passport number, or a driver's license of an individual. Um, yes, thank you. This is, um, this is certainly important, uh, you know, particularly um, from the perspective of uh, undocumented New Yorkers, um, you know, given the um, the, uh, the ways in which uh, health and health care for uh, undocumented immigrants has been challenged um, in recent months and years. Uh, it's something that we take very seriously with respect to protecting uh, the identity and the confidentiality of anyone who, um, who is in the information systems that, uh, you know, that we are responsible for. Specifically with respect to uh, the letter, um, those are uh, things that we are reviewing uh, right now with respect to what, um, you know, would uh, occur uh, as we move further through our uh, vaccination rollout. Um, and we will, you know, first and foremost among that, seek to protect um, identities, protect confidentiality, and ensure that, uh, you know, whether it's undocumented New Yorkers or others that we address um, concerns about information sharing that could have untoward effects on 
their health and well-being. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate hearing back from you on a number of these issues and some of those plans in writing, as well as the community-based organizations, so we can make sure we're doing public engagement in the most inclusive and comprehensive way. Thank you for your answers, and um, I appreciate your testimony and for being here today. And I'll turn it back over to Chair Levine. Thank you, Chair Rivera, for that excellent line of questioning. And now we're going to hear from some of our colleagues, and I'll ask our moderator to please start us off with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairs. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, and this will include answers as well. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer, and you should begin once I have called on you and the sergeant has announced that you may begin. We will now hear questions from council member Powers, followed by council member Barron and then council member Cohen. Council member Powers, you may begin. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you for the chairs and thank you for our, uh, all the staff here uh, and commissioner for your testimony. Um, just a few follow-up questions that I had from uh, previous lines of questions and, and if you just keep answers short since I only have five minutes. Um, I just still confused, who's making the, who makes the decision on the phasing? Is it the city DOH, is it the state, or is it the CDC? So when you do the 1A, 1B, 1C, and then the further phasing, who, who's ultimately making those decisions about uh, who, the prior, prioritization of the vaccine? Uh, it is a collaboration across federal, state, and local government. The federal government, the CDC, makes um, recommendations. Uh, and then it's the state governments that um, elaborate the final prioritization frameworks but they do that in consultation with uh, local health departments. And we've been intimately involved uh, in that with New York State. Okay, but the state has the final say, is that fair to say? For the prioritization guidance, yes, that is correct. Okay, great. And then um, as new, we have two vaccines that are uh, currently available or will be, we hope will be available um, and maybe more. So as new vaccines are approved, I've already heard from folks about which one am I getting and Maybe is one going to be better than the other? So how, how are you handling concerns for people about which vaccine they'll be getting and how will they know if they desire to know which one they'll be getting? Yes, this is something that we're tracking very closely. Um, uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are most likely to be authorized by the FDA soon. Uh, and then um, there are some others that are on the horizon. Uh, we have to look at the details of the data around their safety and efficacy, because there may be signals in that data that indicate that some vaccines are better for specific uh, subpopulations than others. Uh, and so that's, um, that's the way in which we will be uh, following it and issuing guidance, both at the public health level, as well as at the clinical level. Okay, got it. So we're gonna sort of track the vaccines as they're being uh, uh, made available, uh, sounds like. Um, and and uh, Council Member Ferry asked this, but just, you know, just to reiterate, where is the average person going to be getting their vaccine when it's available? Where am I going? Am I going to H&H? Am I going to my pharmacy, doctor? Like, wh where is the average person expected to receive the vaccine? Yes, thanks for the question. Our, our values around this are around access, uh, but also trust. So we wanna make sure that um, when there is that broader phase of availability, which again, will not be for several months for the general public, um, that it's made broadly accessible, you know, in ways that are convenient uh, for, for people in their communities and neighborhoods. But also we wanna rely upon the channels that people already trust. If they have a relationship with um, a doctor or with a hospital or clinic whom they really trust. So it's just a follow-up question here. I can walk to Bellevue in maybe five to 10 minutes. I have a Walgreens on my corner and I have a doctor that's about 15 blocks away. Am I expected to be able to go to any one of those to get the vaccine? Am I expected to go to H&H &H first? Or I have Beth Israel right across the street from my house as well. Uh, which of those avenues are we expecting? And when if, 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 if mid-2021 is the target date or the hopeful date for vaccination for more widespread? Where, where are we expecting um, walking to of those options? 
Um, I think it's fair to say that when we do have that broad availability several months into 2021, um, that we want New Yorkers to have um, to have as many options as possible with respect to where they can get their vaccine. Okay, um, just a few more questions in my time running out. Anyway, uh, the um, uh, when we do H and H staff works inside the city jails. I'm the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. This is why I'm asking the question. Uh, amongst other reasons, um, they're in the they're, they're in the facilities. Are they going to be able to be? Are they going to be? Which which category are they going to be in? I guess is my question. H and H doctors that work inside the city jails. Um, I'll invite Dr. Wallach to comment on this. Great, thank you, Dr. Chachi. So uh, we do consider uh, the uh, healthcare providers on Rikers uh, to be part of our workforce, and they will be included. Uh, as high risk uh, healthcare workers. And in fact, we have moved forward with outfitting uh, Rikers uh, with an ultra cold uh, freezer as well as, as part of our facility. Okay, that's great to hear. Um, I'm just gonna, I have two more questions. I'll just throw them at you and then my time is up. Um, the first one is if I am part of, if I believe I'm part of a priority group or, a, um, or a, I'm a high risk health worker or I'm an essential worker, do I need to go and register for uh, this vaccine and put, put myself a name on a list? If I if I don't know which category I fall in, how do I determine it? And also, I just, again, where am I going to get, if I'm one of those workers, like a high risk health worker, am I getting it at my place of employment or am I going somewhere else? That's sort of question one. And then question two I have is, this actually came to me from a constituent, which is that you know individuals with intellectual and de developmental disabilities have a, are in a, I think a risk category when it comes to COVID. Are they being prioritized at all for vaccine di uh, uh, distribution? Um, when it, you know, or where would they fall into this list as well? Um, thank you for those important questions. Um, we will have uh, you know, more detailed information about the prioritization guidance uh, from both the federal and the state government in the coming days and weeks. Uh, and I think that will um, clarify, you know, a lot of, of what you're asking about. Um, you know, that what I can say at this point is that uh, it will be, you know, more limited um, points of access because of the limited supply initially. Uh, and so, um, you know, we will look to, uh, to match up um, the people who are being prioritized with the locations that make sense for them, whether it's um, having, uh, you know, the CDC pharmacy program in long-term care facilities, or as we're doing, you know, with um, hospitals to have them vaccinate their own high-risk health care. Well, so I guess my, my really kind of my last tag question on that is, you know, who, who, the, of all the high-risk workers that are, uh, that are uh, health care workers that are out there, like, how do we get the, who, who are the 170,000 go to? Like, how do we determine which high-risk health care workers in a larger, a bigger that exists, how do we narrow that down to 170? Is it by registration? Is it by place of employment? Do we have an answer to that? Yes, there, there will be um, forthcoming guidance that uh, will be issued by uh, the state um, that we have been invited to provide uh, input on, and that will help to elucidate uh, exactly the prioritization within phase 1A um, and based on that, we will be able to help people understand where it is that they should seek vaccination. Okay, just saying, this, we're ten days away from. It sounds like you guys. That. So I'm just concerned that we'll be, we'll, we won't have an answer to that. Uh, but but anyway, thank you. I won't take any more time. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you to Dr. Wallach as well. He's been very helpful with me uh, in Bellevue and some questions I had around it. So I want to say thank you to him and all the staff. At the thank UH you. And Thank you. We will now turn to Council Member Barron. Time starts now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the co-chairs for having this hearing. And uh, thank you to the panel for coming and sharing this information with us. I'm going to be pointed so that I can get all of my thoughts and comments onto the record. So has in fact, have in fact these two vaccines been already authorized? No, they have not yet. And do we know, so we're shipping them now or we expect to receive them. They will not, will they be provided for the authorization or do we wait for the final authorization before they are received by the localities? 
The latter is true. Um, it, we will have to wait upon authorization. However, we do know that everyone is making preparations to ship and distribute them so that there is minimal delay between the authorization and when they are shipped. Now, uh, the efficacy and safety of these trials, what is the standard or the threshold for them to be authorized as safe? This is a is good a and very- percentage or is there a number that has to be met? Yes. yes. Um, so th there are, uh, you know, specific both safety and efficacy thresholds that the FDA reviews. It's not, um, it's not exactly a simple number, uh, oh. you know, with respect to a threshold, um, but it has to meet uh, the standards that uh, the FDA has, has set for issuing an emergency use authorization. And it then has to go through another layer of independent review um, which uh, which essentially checks the FDA's work. Great, thank you. So you say you've been working your, uh, you've had input in setting these categories and what group of people will be in each of these categories. Once those categories are set, if New York City feels that, well, uh, a population that's really now in phase 1C should really be in really 1B, are you bound to go by the categories that will be determined um, if you don't, uh, and if you don't, are there consequences for that? Yes, um, a good and important question as well. Yes, we are, you know, somewhat bound to uh, particularly the state uh, guidance around prioritization. Um, certainly, if it seems that there are um, things that need to be adjusted or addressed within that prioritization guidance, uh, we would uh, raise it with our colleagues, both at the state and the federal level. And that's something we'll rely upon uh, you and other community partners to help us with. So now uh, I heard you say that the health and hospital doctors at uh, detention centers and jails are, are going to have access to the uh, vaccine. It'll be stored in the appropriate conditions. Will those who are being detained have access to this vaccine at the same time as the doctors have access? I'll invite Dr. Wallach to comment on that. Thank you for that question. Um, so indeed, uh, you are correct. Uh, the providers uh, will definitely have access and we are working very closely uh, with the Department of Health uh, and other regulatory agencies in that prioritization as well. Um, as you will recall, a uh, significant number uh, of the folks who are on Rikers are there for short periods of time. Um, and so I think there are ongoing discussions uh, about who would qualify uh, or who should be targeted for vaccination uh, based on their length of stay. Thank you. Uh, um, my time is going quickly away. Uh, I think it was Chair Rivera who said that the data shows that the Black population has only a 50% uh, response that they might take this vaccine. And just for the record, we want to make sure that this is not uh, a lack of information, but based on, I would say, more than unfortunate historical legacy, but a criminal historical legacy of sterilization, of hysterectomies, and of withholding treatment, as in the Tuskegee Institute, withholding treatment that would have uh, addressed the conditions of those men uh, and I'm not allowing them to get that treatment, literally watching them die. So that's historical and people know that that has happened and it's built upon a legacy of what this country has. More recently, when this COVID struck and black communities and Latino communities were demonstrating higher levels, that was based on the fact that there's been a history of not, thank you, of not bringing uh, needed medical resources to our community. What are we going to do? How are we going to get to the layers, the underlying layers that exist? And also uh, on a tangent to that, what about those persons who don't want this vaccine? I hear you saying that now there are no requirements for that, but we know that uh, children are required to take vaccines and bring those medical records if they want to attend public schools. So forward thinking, uh, what are we going to do? Two-part question. 
What are we doing about the underlying conditions that made the black and Latino population uh, higher mortality rates from this COVID-19? What are we gonna do about those underlying conditions? Uh, this is sort of an overlay on a very systemic and rooted uh, injustice in our health and criminal justice system as well. What are we gonna do about those underlying conditions and how are we going to make sure that those persons who object for their personal, medical, or historical reasons? Because remember, when this COVID hit, the governor sent the ship to the white community, although they did not have the data showing that they had a great need. And those field hospitals were established in the white community so that they would provide those. So it's not just historical, it's not just decades and centuries ago, it's still today present. And what are we going to do to address that? Thank you. Um, well, thank you. You, you make um, you know, such important points about how uh, it, it's not just the, the history, but how uh, that echoes into uh, the present. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. And I will say it, it resonates with me, um, including you know, thinking about the patients that I have taken care of and how uh, that affects um, their willingness uh, and their interests and their attitudes you know, toward uh, healthcare and treatment. And also your point about the history of, um, of it being around withholding treatment as well. Um, we have uh, tried to ensure that that is foundational in our thinking about equity in our vaccine plan. And that's why the core pieces of it are around uh, ensuring access, uh, monitoring uptake and encouraging uh, uptake in ways that are culturally competent and uh, rooted in that history. Um, but then ultimately it is about outcomes to your point and making sure that we leverage this as an opportunity to, uh, to redress some of what has happened in the past. Uh, but the second part was, what are we going to do systemically to address those issues? And what about people, uh, as we talk about collaborations with other agencies, what if the Department of Education says, moving forward, you have to have this or you won't be admitted? I understand you say the vaccine is basically for 18 and older, but thinking forward, what are we going to do about that? Yes, we are uh, thinking ahead about that. Um, we will uh, we'll have to see the characteristics of the vaccine with respect to safety and efficacy and whether it's something that uh, would warrant uh, you know, a discussion like that um, as we do for certain other vaccines in the school setting. But, um, but we're committed to following the science and not getting ahead of it. And so we have to, uh, we have to take that as it emerges. Thank you very much. Thank you to the chairs for the little extended time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will now turn to other council members, but before I do that, I would like to acknowledge that we have been joined by, um, by other council members. We've been joined by council members Ayala and Eugene. Um, I will now turn to council member Cohen, followed by council member Holden, council member Rosenthal and council member Levin. And as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question and I have not called your name, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Council member Cohen, you may begin. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, chairs. Uh, I, this is an incredibly important hearing. Uh, Dr. Choksi, thank you for all your work. I think that, you know, as we know, the circumstances have been incredibly difficult and uh, uh, I'm very grateful. And I know the people I represent are grateful for the work that you've been doing. Uh, yeah, I just want to follow up on something that uh, uh, <clears throat> Council Member Barron and mentioned about disparities. Like, I won't be here in three months, but in three months, are we gonna have a hearing and find out that there are great disparities in the rate of vaccination once it becomes more widely available? Some populations through for socioeconomic reasons are gonna be easier or, to vaccinate than others. How are we gonna, uh, it would be bad for everybody, particularly the people not getting vaccinated if we come back here and uh, the numbers show you know, wide disparities. Um, thank you, and uh, and I agree with you. And it is something that is uh, a real uh, concern, and one that um, you know we have to plan for, uh, but um, make sure that we're doing it in as close to real time a way as possible. And that's our uh, that's our intent in our plan is to be able to monitor this in a way that we can bring to bear resources 
um, to keep uh, disparities from widening. Doc, you need to be, but you know about the populations that are hard to serve. Like you should be telling us what the plans are now for NYCHA residents, for people that are just generally hard to reach, who, who you know, have trouble accessing these kinds of services. Yes, you're um, absolutely right about you know making sure that we uh, that we learn from what has happened over the last few months and really the last few years. You know, with respect to those disparities, we are actively planning for um, for many different groups. You know, I, we've mentioned the priority neighborhoods, um, NYCHA residents as well, uh, people who are in the congregate settings that we have talked through. Um, you know, each of those has been uh, a collaboration um, that in many cases has been going on for weeks and months. So I want to assure you that that is a part of our planning. Uh, can I, I ask also just as someone who's got a, you know, who will ultimately be on the front lines explaining to people, um, and, and I don't doubt actually the need based on the congregate setting, I guess, but I, I'm concerned about telling, you know, a, a 75 year old constituent who hasn't been able to go to their senior center for you know, for many, many months, why someone uh, in Rikers is a higher priority than they are. Can you just explain the sci the medical science, why that might make sense or why that does make sense? Yes, well, you know, we'll, we'll have to look at the specifics of, um, of the different situations. Uh, what I can tell you is that, um, is to just be upfront that the decisions about prioritization are not easy ones. Um, you know, my, my greatest wish would be that we had sufficient supply to get it to as many New Yorkers as possible, as quickly as possible. In the absence of that, we still do want to get it to, um, to as many people in as fair a way as possible um, and to shorten the time frame of, uh, of the rollout. Yeah, I, I totally, I don't envy you and, and the people doing this work trying to prioritize. Uh, just quickly, uh, could you talk about uh, people who can't get vaccinated? Why can't someone get vaccinated? Sure, I can start and I'll ask Dr. Zucker um, to chime in as well. Um, there are, uh, you know, certain medical uh, conditions that um, would preclude someone from uh, getting a vaccine. Uh, I can't tell you uh, specifically what those are at the moment because we still have to understand them in the context of um, the two vaccines that are awaiting authorization. Uh, but, you know, generally that's the reason. Dr. Zucker, do you want to add anything? Yeah, so I, I will just say as we get the information about the package insert and for example, allergies. So there are people who with a flu vaccine, we screen people if someone's had a prior severe allergic reaction, we wouldn't vaccinate them again. That's one example. You know, there are people with other vaccines who may be immunocompromised where the vaccine hasn't been tested. And so that may be a group um, that vaccine may not be recommended for because there's not data. And so we are awaiting additional information from FDA and from the ACIP guidance. It, it sounds like it's a small universe though. I believe it will be, yes. Uh, and just, just lastly, uh, do you think that you, the 1A phase, like do you have enough or do you anticipate having enough vaccines to fit the 1A status? Um, in short, yes, uh, within the first few weeks. Thank you very, very much, Chairs. Thank you. Um, so we will now turn to Councilmember Holden, then Councilmember Rosenthal, and Councilmember Levin. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, I see that you are now last in the queue to answer questions, but this may have been because you may have had to drop off the Zoom or some other technical issue. Um, so I'm going to keep with the original order, which is Councilmember Holden, then Councilmember Ro Rosenthal, and then Councilmember Levin. So Councilmember Holden, you may begin. Time starts now. Oh, thank you, Chairs, for this great, great hearing. I can't believe we're here. Finally, uh, we're talking about a vaccine. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pachowski, uh, for your testimony. But in your testimony, you mentioned a recently conducted end-to-end -end delivery test in partnership with the CDC and Bronx Care. Uh, can you speak to that? Uh, and what did the test look like? And what are some of the metrics you saw and how and why do you consider it successful? Thank you for asking that question. Um, this is a test that, that we did in collaboration with the CDC. 
um, for uh, essentially a test of the ordering and shipping logistics. Uh, how does an order get from um, New York City uh, to the CDC, to the vaccine manufacturer, and then actually have the shipping container uh, get to the place where it needed to, which is Bronx Care. So you were you were satisfied with with the, how everything worked like clockwork, or were there some bumps in the road? Yes, as far as we uh, were able to um, uh, ascertain at this moment, it worked well. Um, okay, I just want to. You know, and you, you, you touched upon this, I think, with uh, Councilmember Barron's question, but um, I think we have to think about this part. Um, my mom's in a nursing home, um, and none of the none of the, um, the residents uh, have have the COVID, but there were eight. Uh, obviously, there were eight workers, healthcare workers, that came down with it, and this is just recently. And um, so it's almost like, you know, we have to probably vaccinate everyone in that facility because, you know, obviously the COVID could be hiding. There's a few days uh, that, you know, you don't have the symptoms and so forth. Um, but there's another question here. What if some of, and, and you touched upon with the schools, but what if some, somebody in nursing home says, I don't want to get vaccinated? Um, and, or somebody, you know, like you mentioned before about the school, I think we have to kind of figure that out before even vaccination starts, because it's so important. What if somebody says, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, I want to go to school, but I don't want to be vaccinated. And yet they could spread it within um, the school or they could spread it within the community, obviously. So the, who decides that? Is it the state? Do you, do you have any, do you have some answers to that yet? Uh, maybe it's premature, but I think it's important. Yes, well, I, I agree with you that it's a very important uh, discussion and one uh, that's not just about um, the science and the medicine, but brings in, you know, the values and the morals as well. Um, it is, uh, you know, the way that we're thinking about it at this point is we want to get the vaccine to as many people who want it as quickly as possible. Um, and that is, uh, you know, what we are committed to doing to ensure what I described as the individual level benefit of the vaccine. The other important point to make here is that the most protective uh, methods that we have right now, even as the vaccine rolls out in the first few weeks and months, are the things that we've been talking about, um, you know, that, that stop the spread of COVID-19, the so-called core four uh, as well as getting tested. But, but again, uh, we, we have to, I'm not sure I uh, understood some of it because uh, your, an your answer, because I think, let's say a healthcare professional said, I, I, I don't wanna be vaccinated. They're jeopardizing people within that healthcare facility. And the same thing on a, on a nursing home or anything else. So I think we have to figure this out. And I think we need, we need to definitely, we might have to talk, you know, look at the governor, you know, with some laws or look, look, look to the state legislature or the council, but this is going to have to be answered um, because other people are affected by your decisions. Um, I understand your point. I think the only thing that I would say is that um, we do have to ensure uh, protection, particularly when you're, um, when you're a professional who is serving others. Um, but, uh, you know, part of that is making sure that people are wearing the right uh, personal protective equipment um, and taking the infection control precautions in settings like that. All right. I just just some uh, logistics. Um, let's say it is administered. The vaccine is administered by a doctor's office or pharmacy. Uh, will they have to have the the freezers, uh, or can the can the vaccine be left for like let's say seventy two hours, like some vaccines, uh, in a, in a normal refrigerator or freezer? Yes, good question. Um, the answer is slightly different for the two different vaccines. Uh, for the Pfizer vaccine, it, it requires the ultra cold storage, but it can be kept in a normal refrigerator for a few days. Um, so it can be kept in that refrigerator, you know, before administration. So as long as there is a chain uh, that allows for the appropriate uh, refrigeration along different points in the timeline, then that is a possibility. For the Moderna vaccine, it's a regular Reason. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you, chairs. Thank you. Thank you.
So we will now turn to Council Member Rosenthal and then Council Member Levin. So Council Member Rosenthal, you may begin. I'm starting hey. now. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate this hearing. Uh, thank you, chairs, for having this. And of course, thank you to the health department, H&H, uh, &H, for your expertise. Um, you know, I'm a total lay person uh, and really don't understand science. The other day, I heard a Fresh Air um, podcast from November 24th where an epidemiologist explained why people should have no hesitation to getting vaccinated. And he explained it in such a way so as to completely uh, eliminate any reason why anyone should be concerned. He cut through it. I wish I remembered the one sentence, but he cut through that noise uh, like no one I've ever heard explaining that, and I'm going to get this wrong, but it was not like the flu vaccine because you don't get a little bit of the disease, that instead it's something that adjusts your RNA that then doesn't allow the um, COVID to attack your body. And apparently it's part of, or it's an extension of, or part of the reason why people were, the, the phenomenal um, quickness, you know, of getting the vaccine is because there are scientists studying all SARS uh, diseases. Okay, I'm gonna stop because you're nodding your head. And could you just explain for the public why they should have no hesitation to taking this vaccine? Well, thank you so much for that for the opportunity. I will start by saying I'm going to go listen to that Fresh Air podcast so that I can uh, I can explain it in the way that you found so compelling. Um, but since I haven't done that yet, let me give it my best shot, uh, which is. Um, you know, the way that the scientist was describing it is really this amazing uh, miracle of modern science that represents the technology behind these vaccines. Um, it's a piece of genetic material uh, known as mRNA that encodes a specific uh, protein um, that we know uh, comprises part of the COVID-19 virus. And because it encodes that protein, it allows um, the body to essentially develop cells that can identify and attack that protein and neutralize the entire virus by doing it without having to introduce the whole virus into the body. Very close. <laughs> Does anyone else wanna take a stab at it? Because it really is the case that people hear things differently I mean, that was perfect, but does anyone else want to describe it in their own words? Uh, perhaps Dr. Zucker. Actually, I, I thought you did, uh, you know, a great explanation as, as well and, and um, just reinforce that it's amazing that we even have a vaccine, um, you know, at this point. And I will say that I'm also going to go listen to that Fresh Air podcast um for some additional pointers yeah i can't recommend it more highly and i think it's important to get that message out in particular to communities um you know in response to the absolute accuracy of how council member baron council member rivera talk about the um resistance to a vaccine, I, I think it's critical to get that nuance out there and also to explain why there's no reason for anyone to wait till the second batch. You know, this is another common thought out there. Well, let's, let's see how the first batch goes and see what happens and then I'll be in the second round and how completely but how that doesn't make sense. Uh, can you just nail it home for me? Yes, well, I, I'll take the opportunity to, um, to just uh, remind us uh, 
and and you'll have to forgive me for um for being the uh you know the cautious doctor here but we do have to um wait for the science to be totally nailed down um and so as far as we know at this point um you know we will have a safe and effective vaccine as soon as in a few weeks but um but we need the layers of rigorous scientific review um, that we'll hear more about in the coming days. Um, if we have that, and indeed it is what we hope with respect to being a completely safe and effective vaccine, you will uh, hear me and see me shouting it from the rooftops all across New York City. If you think you've seen a lot of me in the last few months, um, you know, it, you're gonna see even more in the coming months. So- sure. um, Chairs, with your indulgent, I, indulgence, I just really want to seal this deal. So if um, the FDA, who's doing that rigorous science now, two questions. Is there any way that it could be influenced by political leaders who don't believe in science? And secondly, could they possibly say, stop? we're not going forward, this is not the miracle vaccine we thought it was, at which point everything would stop. Um, so the answers to your questions uh, are, um, in my view, no and yes. So um, I believe the FDA um, has a commitment to the career scientists who will be doing that rigorous review, um, who will be independent of political influence and I have been following this very closely, uh, and I believe that um, they will uh, be uh, free and they will not be influenced with respect to their review. Um, and that's important for your second question, which is, you know, they will be looking through the reams of data um, for their very important jobs, which is to really ensure that it meets this threshold of both safety and efficacy. And so there is um, a possibility that uh, they would not authorize the vaccine, but I wanna be very clear, that is not what we expect. Based on everything that we know at this moment in time, we expect that both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines will be authorized, uh, but we have to wait for that formal review. Well, Mazel Tov, thank you all for your really hard work, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to council member Levin and just one final reminder, Thank you. We will now turn to Council Member Levin and just one final reminder that if you would like to ask questions and you have not yet already done so, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Council Member Levin, you may begin. I'm stopped now. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chairs. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, uh, I have a few questions. Um, first question is, how? what's the plan to, um, to deliver vac vac vaccinations to uh, homebound seniors or anybody that's homebound? Yes, um, thanks for this uh, really important question. It's one that I've been thinking about, um, again, you know, thinking about the patients that I've taken care of who are homebound as well. Um, so two parts to the answer. Uh, the first is uh, we have to make sure that the workforce, you know, the healthcare workforce uh, that, um, that often delivers, uh, you know, home-based care uh, is part of, of the group that will be vaccinated among healthcare workers. Uh, so that's number one, and they will be a part of, of phase one of, uh, of the vaccination efforts. And then the second part is, you know, much more about the logistics and the operations of it, uh, working with partners like, you know, visiting nurses, uh, other uh, home care agencies, their home-based primary care programs, um, and ensuring that those are a part of how we will actually get the vaccine to people who may not be able to make it to a clinic, a pharmacy, or a hospital. Sorry. Uh, there are, uh, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of, of home care workers in New York City. So it, it's really important that we're working with all of those not-for-profits that they work with and for-profits that they work with to, um, to make sure that they're part of that first round. So all those home care workers, because it's probably, there's got to be ten, tens of thousands, uh, if not more, 100,000 home care workers in New York City. Um, so that's very important. It is about 60,000. So yes. 60,000. Okay. Um, uh, and let's see, um, 
uh, do we have a commitment, um, and I hope we do, that we're not going to be moving um, uh, single adults who were um, in uh, in the shelter system that have been moved into uh, uh, non-congregate settings, so into the hotel settings? Do we have a commitment that they will not be moving back into congregate settings until the public health emergency is is uh, is over? Um, well, I can tell you what my understanding of this is, uh, which is that unfortunately, you know, because we are seeing the resurgence in cases, uh, that there are no, um, you know, near-term plans for uh, for moves like the ones that you're saying. Uh, but beyond okay. that, you know, I know that it's a it's a broader decision than um, than than just uh, you know my recommendation. Okay. But I would do appreciate your recommendation and your input in the matter. I chair the General Welfare Committee, and um, it's been a, a large effort to get people out of the congregate settings. I think it's done; um, it's been very impactful. But I just want to make sure that we're not um, uh, jumping the gun. So long as you know the the costs are reimbursed seven years, seventy five percent from FEMA. So. Um, Sorry, um, and um, and then uh, ha, uh, individuals with sickle cell disease. Um, what would be the plan for individuals with sickle cell disease? Uh, do you mean what whether they can be vaccinated or with what um, priority? Both, 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 both. <clears throat> Excuse me, both. Yes. So again, we do have to you know see the details of the of the data with respect to both vaccines and understand. Um, you know, how much it, it was or was not uh, studied uh, among individuals with sickle cell disease. I have not heard anything that would indicate that there, that um, having sickle cell disease would be a contraindication to vaccination. Uh, but, you know, we have to uh, follow the science on that point as well. Um, and then, you know, as, uh, as may be apparent, uh, people with sickle cell disease are considered higher risk for COVID-19 and so would be um, would be prioritized accordingly. Um, I, uh, I think sickle cell disease is on the stay at home advisory. So I, 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 I suppose it was also the question of, of how, how the vaccine would be delivered to individuals with sickle cell disease. Well, I, it gives me a chance to clarify the stay at home advisory um, uh, only applies to non-essential services. So uh, okay. getting medical care is an essential service. And in fact, I wanna strongly encourage uh, that you and um, you know all of the networks that you're a part of uh, clarify that um, getting your medical care, whether it's routine or emergent, is essential, even as we're seeing this resurgence. Um, thank. You. And then one final question, chairs, um, if I may. Um, I, I'm just I'm a little bit I'm, I'm interested to know in more detail the um, the 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 system by which you track. Um, uh, how you'll be tracking who has been and who hasn't been um, vaccinated. So, um, I mean, is there essentially a New York State Department of Health or New York City Department of Health database that has, you know, the medical records of every person that's been to a doctor or hospital in, in, in the city? And we're going to be, you know, there'll be some indication as to whether they've been um, vaccinated or not, or how, 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 speak a little bit about the kind of the system, the tracking system that you're going to have. Sure. Well, there are two levels of this. Um, the first is the electronic health record, uh, you know, associated with, um, where uh, you can get the vaccine, whether it's a hospital, a clinic, or a pharmacy. And so there will be, you know, one layer of, um, of tracking or monitoring based on that. And then the second is what you've pointed out, which is our citywide immunization registry, uh, which will be you know, the backbone across uh, all of the different EHRs um, you know, and other settings where people may get their vaccine. So we will be able to keep track of who has gotten their first dose, which vaccine they got their first dose of, um, and put into place uh, the protocols that we need to, um, to remind people for their second dose. Sorry, just to, um, oh, sorry. Just to be clear, so I know that the the so the vaccination registry can track who has gotten a dose and and um, and a second dose, but is it are, is it able to track who has not? Uh, 
No, um, no, it, it would not be able to. That's correct. Um, okay, but but we, we'll but we'll be able to kind of see in in broad strokes, you know, uh, percentage of the population in in whatever geographical area that we're breaking it down to, whether that's zip code or census tract or uh, so on and so forth. And, and so we'll be kind of gauging our progress in um, geographic geographical areas that way. Um, yeah, precisely right. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you. Um, seeing no other council member questions, I will now turn it back to our chair, Chair Levine. Uh, thank you. Uh, just very briefly, because I am sensitive to the time constraints that uh, folks at the administration have. But I do want to follow up on Councilman Rosenthal's important line of questioning with just a clarification, uh, because there are some internet rumors out there about how mRNA vaccines work, and they do not. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the form of a question. Can you confirm that they do not temporarily or permanently alter the DNA of the recipient. That is correct. And they don't even enter the nucleus, is that right? Uh, yes, that is also correct. Uh, thank you, because uh, we're, we're, we're seeing already some um, science-based, uh, science-denying chatter on this front. I wanted to clarify that. And lastly, and last very quickly, uh, Thank you. So uh, FQHCs uh, will be part of your deployment plan, correct? Absolutely. Um, FQHCs, uh, also known as community health centers, as you know, uh, will be a critically important part of our um, distribution and access plan because we know uh, how important they are um, in terms of access uh, for New Yorkers, particularly the communities of color that we've talked about, um, as well as low-income New Yorkers and immigrant New Yorkers. And what about Article 28 clinics? Uh, yes, Article 28 clinics um, are also a part of our plan. Uh, is there, uh, I'll invite Dr. Zucker if there's anything more specific on that point. Um, no, I think Article 28 clinics are included. And for example, the Gotham clinics are Article 28, the hospitals are Article 28, and so they are included in our plan. Great. Obviously, serving, serving an extremely high needs population, so important that they be included. Okay. Yes. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you to the administration, to everyone at the health department and at H&H &H, uh, for this uh, very good presentation. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. And I think it's valuable that the public was able to uh, receive this information. And I, I'm gonna pass it to Chair Rivera who has um, uh, some follow-ups as well. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I just wanna thank you for, for what you said about doing this from a, starting from a point of humility. I, I think, you know, we have hundreds of years of, of race-based, harmful medicine that has been inflicted on individuals. And, you know, I think about that in my own work when I'm fighting for reproductive justice and access to healthcare, and I have to grapple with and constantly be reminded of that troubling history of forced sterilization on, on Puerto Rican women, people in my own family. And the COVID data shows that the most impacted communities are black and brown communities. It's because of race, it's because of the social determinants of health. And I just wanna be sure that, you know, there is going to be a saturation of vaccine sites in our neighborhoods hardest hit. It, it has to be, I, I mean, really, I understand there's a, a an educational component, but that really, really concerns me in making sure that people just have the access. They should be able to walk somewhere and be able to get the medicine that they need and the access that they need. I realize that's a larger systemic issue that we have to tackle. And please know that I'm always an ally and supporter in that fight. My question is, is, is how you plan to do outreach to individuals with comorbidities or underlying health conditions. How will people with those conditions know if they qualify for prioritization? How will they certify proof of those conditions? 
and particularly for those who may not receive care frequently, specifically homeless New Yorkers with chronic conditions? Yeah, well, first, um, thank you so much for your powerful comments about, uh, about equity and its very tangible implications for, uh, for vaccination. Um, they're they are at the front of our minds as well, and we'll have to stay um, in communication, you know, to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to address that imperative. Uh, with respect to your question, um, again, you know, I, I will just put on my, my um, clinical hat to say uh, that this is something that can be challenging with respect to, um, you know, conducting outreach and actually making sure that um, certain uh, groups of patients who are often most in need of the services that we have to offer, uh, you know, actually reach those services. And so I have a, um, a realistic perspective on it that it is uh, sometimes easier said than done. Um, but what I can say is that there is a commitment to, um, to ensuring that uh, our messages, um, you know, reach those populations. Um, we can't do it all ourselves. And what I've really appreciated about the opportunity today is to, um, to ask all of you to join us because this is a, you know, such a, um, a citywide, uh, uh, you know, um, initiative that we'll have to take on. Um, but specifically for the groups that you've mentioned, you know, people who have underlying health conditions uh, and homeless New Yorkers with chronic conditions, um, there are, you know, specific ways that we can engage them. Um, one is relying on the people whom they already trust, uh, whether it's the clinicians at uh, places like health and hospitals or the homeless service providers who, you know, provide uh, vital services to them or our Department of Homeless Services, uh, you know, who also have um, deep relationships with many of those organizations and the individuals themselves. And so we will work across those institutions and partners. Thank you. And we will certainly be helpful. So I'm looking forward to working with those community-based organizations or even suggesting others that might not be included in that initial list that we'll receive. Thank you so much for all of your answers today and for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. We're not going to go to our next panel in a moment and I'll cue the moderator. I do want to thank everyone from DOHMH, especially you, Commissioner, uh, for that excellent presentation and and H and H as well. You know, while we were speaking over the last couple of hours, uh, today's COVID numbers in New York City posted, and uh, I won't review them in detail. But um, suffice to say that um, we continue to face a very difficult circumstance in the short term, and our discussion today about the incredible hope on the horizon with vaccines can't distract us from the immediate fight that we have in the weeks and really months ahead. Uh, and I know you emphasize that commissioner, but uh, I do think it's important that we move forward on both fronts, uh, slowing the spread immediately today uh, while preparing for uh, the incredible uh, deployment of vaccines in the months ahead. Thank, thank you again to the administration. I'll ask the moderator to move on to our next panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so again, thanks to the members of the administration. We will now move to public testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions can use the Zoom raise hand function. You will be called on after the panel has completed its testimony in the order in which you have raised your hand. The first public panel in order of speaking will be um, Tanya Alcorn and Faith Walters, both representatives from Pfizer. Um, so Tanya Alcorn, you may begin when ready. Time starts now. Great, thank you so much. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Thank you, Chair Levine and Ch Chair Rivera and the committee for having us here. I'm gonna let, um, so let me just introduce myself. I'm Tani Alcorn and I lead Pfizer supply chain and responsible for the global distribution strategy for the COVID vaccine. And I've been working very closely with the US government, CDC, 
um, on um, the distribution strategy within the US. I'm going to let Faith um, kick off some opening comments around our vaccine development um, program, and then I will handle some opening comments on distribution. We will do our best to keep to the restricted time. Thanks. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you, um, chairs and committee members, for having us here today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you on behalf of Pfizer and the Pfizer vaccines team. Everyone has been working hard, I think, across the city, across Pfizer, and we're thankful to have the opportunity to bring some good news here today. Um, I'm Faith Walters. I am part of the Vaccines U.S. Medical Affairs Team and the Field Medical Lead for Vaccines. Today, I'd like to briefly touch on a few things, vaccine development, effectiveness, and duration of immunity, which I know have all been hot topics here today, and I am enjoyed the discussion as well. As you all are very aware, Pfizer has worked in collaboration with our partner BioNTech to bring a vaccine candidate forward in this fight against COVID-19 that we're all facing and working hard to fight every day. We started with the SARS-CoV-2 um, genetic sequence in January. We've worked extremely closely side by side with the FDA in every part of this study. Um, and we were able to begin our phase one, two trial in late April and then move to the phase two B3 trial in late July. On November 18th, we announced that our COVID-19 vaccine candidate met all primary efficacy endpoints in that phase three study. Um, the analysis of the data indicated a vaccine efficacy rate of 95% in participants without prior SARS-CoV-2 infection and also in participants with and without SARS-CoV-2. It was a priority for us in our trial to recruit a diverse population, um, focusing on those that were disproportionately affected by this virus. Our phase three results show that efficacy was consistent across age, gender, race, and ethnicity demographics. Um, regarding tolerability, the data demonstrated that the vaccine was well tolerated across all populations. Um, on November 20th, Pfizer did submit our emergency use authorization request to the FDA for our COVID-19 vaccine and a VRPAC meeting has been scheduled for December the 10th. That will be the time that our phase three data in its completeness is, um, is presented in the public domain. Regarding duration of immunity, um, duration of immunity is unknown at this time with our vaccine. We will be following all of our study participants for 24 months and that's post dose, post the second dose and assessing immune response over this time. So thank you and Tanya, I will turn it back to you. Okay, great. Um, I know we're coming up on time. So I just wanna compliment um, my colleagues uh, comment. And again, it's been a, it's a privilege as we say within Pfizer to be working on such an important uh, vaccine for society. Um, from a manufacturing perspective, we have activated an extensive US manufacturing network um, and we are on track based on our current manufacturing projections to, to produce globally up to 50 million vaccine doses um, in 2020 and uh, up to 1.3 billion doses in 2021. We have a very strong proven track record, um, obviously a company well established, um, we have hundreds of products on the market, you know, over 100 countries and, and so our expertise gives us a large uh, base and foundation for success. Um, we've developed very detailed logistical plans um, to ensure effective vaccine transport, storage, uh, and continuous monitoring uh, programs. As you may have seen in Governor Cuomo's uh, press conference yesterday, we have also 
um, uh, have developed an innovative uh, shipper that's been specifically designed for this product to maintain the recommended temperature conditions during transportation for up to 10 days, which we feel was important to allow for ample transportation time to all points of use, including cities, rural areas, farther destinations, et cetera. And we will be shipping for the US um, in a model that is direct, so direct from our sites to those points of vaccinations, those points of use. Again, using our Kalamazoo, Michigan um, manufacturing facility and our Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin, distribution center to support our Kalamazoo uh, facility. So it's a direct shipment model um, with these uh, innovative shippers. There'll be, uh, there's a device within the shippers that will have uh, GPS enabled thermal sensors. So every shipper um, will be monitored by a, a dedicated Pfizer control tower that will track the location, the real-time temperature of each vaccine until they get to their predetermined location and across their predetermined routes. And we will be able to monitor real time and proactively act and prevent any unwanted deviations before they happen to make sure they get to those points of use on time at the right temperature at the right quality. Once it does um, uh, get to those points of use, as, as the previous testimony um, and the doctors on, on, on uh, the committee here mentioned, there's really three options. They can go into ultra low temperature freezers, which then allows for a shelf life of up to six months. Our, our thermal shippers can actually be used as a temporary storage location uh, option, just with uh, the need to refill with dry ice every five days. Uh, in accordance with our handling instructions. And again, we thought that was an important option to have um, for those facilities that may not have an ultra low temperature freezer. And lastly, the vaccine can be stored in a refrigerated condition for up to five days. And we know refrigeration units are very commonly available. So with that, I know we're over time. I will, I will just say that we feel that we have um, built over the last few months, a very robust and uh, distribution model. And we feel very confident in our ability to supply. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Alcorn and, and Dr. Walters. Uh, we're grateful that you're here today. Um, it's been reported that New York State is expecting 170,000 doses um, the week of December 14th. Uh, can you confirm that that's uh, an accurate assessment? Um, so two points. One, we don't have authorization to ship, and then we don't know when we will receive authorization. So we can't confirm any date because none of us, you know, we need to wait for that authorization. And, and as was stated earlier, we, we're not allowed to ship until we have that authorization. Um, and then um, we are not responsible for the allocation across the state. state. So we're working with um, the U.S. government on a, a complete allocation for the U.S. And, and then that allocation per country, I'm sorry, per state and um, per jurisdiction um, is not a Pfizer kind of predetermined um, decision. Understood. Is it assumed that you would have to ship another 170,000 for a second dose to the first round individuals within three weeks? Or would um, that initial shipment of 170,000 or whatever number it is um, have to be held partly in reserve for a second dose? So we're working very uh, closely with the CDC um, on that strategy. And it may be a combination of both those options, depending on the capabilities of the receiving location, if they have ultra low temperature freezers, the ability to store, et cetera. Um, but right now our assumption is that we would be shipping for the most part, that second dose a couple weeks later, once we, and we would get the order from, from the CDC to do so. Thank you. And, and Dr. Walters, could, could you in, in, in layperson's terms, talk about what you've understood about side effects uh, and their prevalence? What we saw from our phase one data, as well as what we have initially um, in, the, in the press on our phase three data is that the vaccine is uh, well tolerated. So we'll hear more about this at the VRPAC meeting when they present the full safety data in the public domain. Um, can you tell us what the most common side effects have been in the studies? Well, we have seen um, pain at the site of injection, um, uh, some fatigue, some headache, and some fever. But I can't speak to the percentages of those at this time. Those sound very similar to the side effects from a flu vaccine. I would say that side effects like that are common with immunizations. Um, I've, I've heard some folks who presume that 
a side effect could be a sign that the vaccine is really working for you. And, and conversely, that if you don't get side effects, um, folks might worry that it really wasn't having effect. Uh, I don't think that's accurate, but perhaps you could, uh, you could comment on that or dispel it. Well, I would say that when you do see some reactogenicity with, um, you know, as there is a response and they're developing immunity. Uh, in, in other words, uh, strong side effects do indeed correlate to a stronger development. Of I wouldn't immunity. go that far as to say that the strong side effects, you know, correlate to immunity. But I think what we've seen with our vaccine is that it is well tolerated. We've seen, uh, as I saw, I mentioned previously, um, greater than 95% efficacy. So. So far, we're, uh, we're very encouraged by what we see, and we look forward to the VRPAC meeting on December the 10th. I understood, but just to clarify, so someone who gets no side effects, should they worry that the vaccine is having, that creating less immunity No, you them? will see, I mean, and this is what you'll see when you see the data. You do see variability in um, adverse events across populations. Similar to when we all take the flu vaccine, you may see a different response that you have versus a response that I have. But it doesn't cor correlate to efficacy. No. That's good to know. You've heard uh, over the last couple of hours, a lot of questions about vaccines effectiveness and safety for specific populations, children, for example, um, some people with uh, specific pre-existing condition, uh, conditions such as uh, people who are immunocompromised. Uh, I understand that, um, that there's not adequate data yet to comment on safety and efficacy for those populations. If, if that is indeed the case, could you give us a sense on when we might know more for those specific individuals? On the day of VRPAC, we're going to know more details based on the segments of the population, like you refer to, based on age ranges, looking at um, adverse event safety, um, even efficacy in those groupings. And I think you're very familiar with our, our clinical trial. Um, it started out at 18 to 85, and then September um, the FDA gave us the approval to take off that 85-year-old cap as well as to go down to 16 years of age. And then in October, they gave us the approval to decrease the trial to 12 years of age and older. Do you expect eventually to go to even younger? Well, we're working with the FDA right now to look at um, a study in a younger population, knowing that 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 possibly could mean a different dosing schedule, um, a different dose. So we're working closely with them on those next steps. Can you say anything about the efficacy for someone who just gets one dose and never, go, never goes to get the second dose? We don't have that data in the public domain now. I would expect that you know, our full trial results will be presented at the VRPAC. Suffice and we'll to all say look forward to that. But suffice to say, we, we are strongly encouraging everyone to follow the regimen and get their yes. second dose, uh, which I guess is 21 to 28 days later. Is that the suggested range? Our vaccine is day one. You know, it's first dose day one, second dose day 21. I will say that in our clinical trial, the patients, that second dose was day 21 plus or minus two days. So that was like a day 19 to day 23 range on the second dose. And Finally, I agree, you, we do encourage everybody to get both doses. Thank you. Finally, could you, could you tell us um, the extent to which uh, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups were uh, representative as participants in your studies, uh, particularly African-Americans, which of course have, have borne such a, 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 a terrible disproportionate impact on this uh, pandemic? Yes, so in the US, 30% of our uh, trial participants were from diverse populations and 10% of those were African-American. Okay, that would be uh, perhaps slightly below uh, at least um, the representation amongst uh, COVID fatalities, uh, which I think for African-Americans is 19%. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're just, we're just, I'm sorry, what were you gonna say? 
No, I, I it, it, it's terrible. I'm agreeing with you. And diversity in the clinical trial has been a huge um, priority for us. It has to be. Um, yes. Partly because we need the scientific benefit of that. And also because we want to build trust that every segment of society feels um, that they are getting the resources and, and attention they deserve. Um, so absolutely. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Walters. I'm going to pass it thank to my you. colleague. Thank you. I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Chair Rivera. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just want to kind of recap some of the things that you mentioned. I know there's no authorization to ship yet, and there's a greater than 95% efficacy rate. And we mentioned a little bit about the safety and side effects being somewhat typical, right, to the flu vaccine, though that might um, differ. And I guess what I'm what I'm ask, what I wanted to just ask plainly is in terms of how effective it is. Is it equally effective across gender, age, weight, race, and other populations? So our initial data that we, that analyzing our phase three data has shown that the results showed efficacy that was consistent across age, gender, race, ethnicity. Um, I think we'll have to look at the phase three data that they present at Verpac to see as they dig into maybe differences in weight, as you mentioned. And in terms of those individuals who may have disabilities, I, I ask right. So with, I ask because people with developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities have died at three times the rate of those without disabilities. And that was that's information that we're going to get from those more detailed phase three studies. So that will be presented at VERPAC. Okay. Anything on the right, the breakdown of comorbidities, potentially disabilities, um, we'll have transparency to that level of data at that time. And and it's effective. Is it effective for pregnant people? We did not study it in pregnant um, or lactating um, individuals. So that is another place where we are working closely with the FDA to um, look at a potential pathway in pregnancy. I ask because people who want to become pregnant may be reluctant to get the vaccine unless we know it's safe for them. And based on, you know, just the, the history when you are trying to get pregnant and things you right. have consider even in getting rubella or the measles vaccine, those can have pretty serious side effects. So do we have an idea of how long immunity will last from your vaccine? We do not at this time. So um, we are continuing to study all of our trial participants out through 24 months post that second dose, looking at safety as well as immunogenicity over that time. And from that information, we'll then be able to tell the full duration of immunity. What is the expected monthly production rate of doses once you reach full-scale production? Uh, thank you, Chair Rivera. We can't speak to the monthly rate of changes as we're scaling up, but we are committed, as I mentioned, um, to have approximately 50 million doses globally available, of which half have been allocated to the US. And for next year, we have, um, we're on track for up to 1.3 billion doses. Um, so I can't speak to a monthly run rate, um, but I can, I can reconfirm those numbers. Do you expect the federal government's potential enactment of the Defense, Defense Production Act to impact or speed up production of your vaccine in any way? I mean, I can't comment to the intent, um, that intention, but I, I can just say that we are, um, you know, this is our number one priority as a company. Um, we have every, um, all manpower efforts, resources, our supplier network is fully engaged um, and we are ramping up at the speed of science. So, um, and our partnership with the US government has been, has been great. So I don't see that having any impact. We're already um, running as, 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 fast as we can with our in ensuring the right quality standards along the way. 
Um, so I, I can't speak to that intention, but I don't, uh, I don't anticipate any concern. Do you have any thoughts as to herd immunity? in terms of having enough doses to provide to enough people for herd immunity and relying on the development of other vaccines to achieve it? I think it's gonna take a while to assess, um, you know, what is needed to get to herd immunity in the United States. Well, we look forward to, um, you know, any other answers or information once you've all had kind of a, a very big meeting with information specifically on that demographic breakdown. Again, just, you know, some concerns Thank you. Sure that those who were disproportionately affected have access. We're looking forward to working with you and thank you for being here today. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I see that council member Barron has some questions for this panel. And I just like to remind other council members present that if you have questions, uh, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Council member Barron, you may begin when you're ready. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the panel for coming. I have some very brief questions. What is the temperature at which this vaccine has to be stored? Yep, thank you for your question. So it has to be stored um, at um, uh, minus 70 um, degrees, plus or minus 10 degrees Celsius. Celsius, okay. And you talked about the tracking system that you have during the time that the vaccine is being shipped to its location and you have real time tracking and monitors and all of that. Mm -hmm. And that when it's delivered, it can in fact remain in those containers or that uh, device and simply needs to have dry, well not simply, and has to have dry ice added at least every five days to maintain the temperature? Yes, Commissioner Barron, that's, that's um, correct. you've heard it um, exactly correct. So, and oh, we have- I didn't, I didn't, I'm not a commissioner, I don't wanna displace anybody. <laughs> Congress, I'm sorry. No council problem. member. Council member, apologies, council member. Yeah, so you have it exactly no correct. Um, and okay. yeah, we, our, our shipper can be used temporarily for storage okay. with dry ice, correct. Okay, thank you. Now you said that the, are the efficacy results based on both doses and based on the fact that they are given within that time period that you talked about 19, 20, 21 days. So is that a determinant of saying that's how effective this uh, product has been? So it was based on, they had both doses. So the dose at day one and the dose at day 21. And like we said, it could occur between day 19 and day 23 for that second dose. And then they look seven days after that. So it's basically at day 28 that they're doing the analysis to look at the efficacy of the vaccine. Right, so what if a person doesn't get that second dose within that window that's designated? And how are right. we going to be sure that we have the adequate number of doses available for that second day or that second dose uh, within that time frame? What are the guarantees that the shipment will be sent in that uh, time order to make sure that the uh, supply is available on day on the second dose day. So, from a shipment perspective, Faith, I can um, I can answer that. So yeah, we, we have um, we have synchronized this very well um, to ensure that before uh, before that twenty one day that they would be. The second dose available at those points of use. So we have that worked out with the CDC with the order management process. Um, so the, the doses will be there um, for that second time. Time expired. Thank you. And my last question. Um, normally side effects, uh, I would think that with other trials that are conducted, you have a period of time after you've reached your product and determine its efficacy to say what in fact side effects are. We can certainly address the immediate side effects, but since we're now going hyperspeed to get this product out, what are the possibilities that there might be side effects beyond what we have been able to see during this period of time that we've developed this drug? 
So I can tell you that safety is a huge priority for us, just like it is in all of our trials. Um, we are continuing to monitor these patients for 24 months after that second dose, like I said, and that's for safety, looking at immunogenicity over time, as well as, uh, you know, we have a system for adverse event reporting so that when if an adverse event occurs when someone takes uh, one of our vaccines, that that is reported to Pfizer. And then the CDC also has some already established systems for collecting safety and adverse event data, the VAR system, and they have vSafe, which is a new system that's gonna be put in place just to monitor and awareness of providers and patients um, for safety adverse events around the COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you. Thank you to the chairs. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, seeing no other hands raised, I think we're ready to move on to the next panel. Unless and I just want to, I do want to thank both uh, Ms. Alcorn and Dr. Walters for joining us. It's incredibly helpful to have your perspective. And um, we, we're grateful to all the scientists who worked around the clock over the last 11 months to pull this off. It is just extraordinary um, and um, so something that we can all be proud of. Appreciate you Thank being you. here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much again for your testimony. Um, so we will now turn to the next panel. And as a reminder, please wait to be told you may begin before starting and someone will unmute you once your name is called. Um, the next person who will be speaking is Umar Khan from the office of the New York State Attorney General. Good afternoon. My name is Umar Khan. I'm special counsel to New York State, special senior advisor and special counsel to New York State Attorney General Letitia James. Um, thank you, Chair Levine. And Chair Rivera for holding this hearing on such a critical issue of oversight over the COVID-19 vaccine. The devastating impact of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic will not be fully measured for years to come. What we do know is that it has magnified the disparities in our city, the state, and the nation. The virus has had a disproportionate impact on the lives of our seniors and communities of color. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Black, Latino, and Native American communities are each confronting about a three-fold increase in death rates as compared to whites. Indeed, these communities are also hospitalized at a rate four times higher than whites. Yet these statistics do not incorporate the lasting economic and healthcare effects on communities of color. In the coming weeks and months, various vaccines will start to be distributed across our city and state. It is critical that underserved and vulnerable constituencies are not left behind. This will require a multi-pronged approach that will not only ensure that vaccines are distributed equitably, but we must also reduce any barriers to vaccinations. This week, in fact, just yesterday, I led a coalition of attorneys generals in urging Congress to allocate funding and codify coverage protections to guarantee that all people living in the United States are able to obtain a COVID-19 vaccine at no cost. The purpose of our letter, as I'll detail below, was threefold. First, provide the vaccine to Medicare recipients at no cost. Second, properly fund programs for the uninsured to cover administrative fees. And third, increase financial support for Medicaid. The federal Medicare and Medicaid programs play a critical role for healthcare coverage. 62 million people or 19% of our population are insured under Medicare. In the past, Medicare has not covered the cost of drugs approved under emergency use designation. Recently, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services issued a rule providing that any vaccine authorized by the Food and Drug Administration through an emergency use authorization or license under a biologics license application will be covered to Medicare beneficiaries. We believe the best practice would be for Congress to codify this rule. With the rise in unemployment due to the pandemic, Medicaid has proven to be an essential safety net with growing enrollment. 
under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, state Medicaid programs are eligible to receive an increase in federal funding during the current public health emergency, provided that the state agrees to provide coverage of COVID-19 vaccines and vaccine administration, among other things, at no cost sharing to most Medicaid beneficiaries. As we know, states including New York are already struggling financially and will likely need additional financial assistance from the federal government to supplement the funding provided under the FFCRA. This support will ensure that payment rates to providers which are set at the state level are sufficient to allow Medicaid recipients to access the vaccine at no cost and providers to perform critical outreach to vulnerable communities. Our letter also seeks to guarantee that the uninsured are not responsible for any costs associated with the administration of the vaccine. Congress established a provider relief fund that could be used to cover costs associated with administering and storing the vaccine known as administrative fees. However, billions from this fund have already been distributed to providers and we are concerned that there will not be sufficient resources remaining to cover vaccine administration fees as well as costs for outreach to uninsured communities. Accordingly, we ask Congress to adequately fund this, particularly if the Supreme I'm Court expired. brings down the Affordable Care Act. The federal government has arrangements, as we've heard earlier, with pharmacies to provide and administer the vaccine. The first initiative, known as the Pharmacy Partnership for Long-Term Care Program, is with CVS and Walgreens. These companies are authorized to administer COVID-19 vaccines to long-term care facility residents and staff. This is an important effort, but we must guarantee that long-term care facilities that serve substantial populations from communities of color are treated equally with regards to vaccine access and timing. The second federal initiative is with large chain pharmacies and networks that represent independent pharmacies and regional chains. Similarly, we must ensure equitable distribution with respect to access and timing here as well. With regards to enforcement, my office established a task force more than two months ago to anticipate and prepare for challenges and issues related to COVID-19 vaccines. As I have always stated, no one is above the law. Whether you're engaging in insider trading on promising new treatments, price gouging New Yorkers for critical vaccine administration supplies, or peddling fake cures, we are, up, we are here to uphold the law. I also wanna take this opportunity to highlight our anonymous whistleblower portal. If you're aware of unlawful conduct, you may report this at https colon backslash backslash ag.ny.gov backslash whistleblower. The Office of Attorney General is vigilantly seeking to protect New Yorkers and ensuring that the most vulnerable and disproportionately harmed by this disease receive equitable access to vaccines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Khan. And, and the Attorney General James has just been so strong on a variety of healthcare issues uh, throughout the pandemic. And I appreciate your focus now on accessibility of the vaccine, no matter the income or the insurance status of the, the patient. Um, are you also focusing on any kind of guarantees that people who do have insurance won't have to pay uh, a copay to get vaccinated? Sorry, we need to unmute you. There we go. Chairman Levy, I'm not authorized to make, to answer any questions at this time. Fair enough. Well, we appreciate you being here and for um, the Attorney General's testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now turn to our next panel. The next panel will be Hope Levy, Margaret Punnington, and Peter Tebeck. As a reminder, please wait to be told you may begin before starting and somebody will unmute you once your name is called. Hope Levy, you may begin. I'm starts now. I believe that Peter was going to start. Um, I can certainly start, but I think Peter was uh, to begin, if that's okay. 
That's fine. Um, do we have, can we, there we go. Uh, Peter Tabak, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levine, Chair Rivera, your efforts on behalf of the health of all New Yorkers. It gives us confidence in our city's ability to meet a tremendous challenge. And Council Member Powers, thank you for asking what you've asked. Our time today is brief, but the story of the coronavirus and our community, New Yorkers with intellectual and developmental disabilities, begins in the earliest hours of the pandemic. Commissioner Chokshi is right. We must learn from the last few months. We request that the council recognize the disproportionate vulnerability of people with intellectual and mental disabilities, affirm the urgency of priority access to a vaccine, and demonstrate that outpatient clinics such as Premier Healthcare, especially those that specialize in treating, treating people with IDD and their staff, must be on the front lines of vaccine distribution. Now that the CDC has published guidelines that prioritize residents of long-term care facilities, we urge an interpretation that residents of the city's supportive housing and the exceptional direct support workers who make those houses into homes are part of the priority plan. The unvarnished truth is painful. The last several months have revealed enormous gaps in resources to support New Yorkers with IDD. More than four decades after deinstitutionalization, New Yorkers with IDD remain marginalized and unable to access adequate care. Now that a vaccine may be hours away, we must not exacerbate this disparity. YAI provides comprehensive support for children and adults. We are also the institutional home of Premier Healthcare, a primary care and specialty outpatient clinic. Our 4,000 employees deliver housing, medical care, dental and mental health care, education, job training and community integration to more than 20,000 people with autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy and other disabilities and their families. Despite the prevalence of underlying health conditions within this population, people with IDD have flown under the radar since the start of the pandemic when COVID cases ballooned with a disproportionate mortality rate at their heels. One study published in November showed a mortality rate almost three times that of all patients with COVID. Data from the state is even more distressing and it's new since we submitted our testimony yesterday of 4,603 confirmed COVID cases among people with disabilities, almost 80% lived in residential programs like those operated by YAI and our peers. And the statewide mortality rate there was greater than 12%. Many things explain this outside vulnerability. Simple preventative measures like social distancing, masks and hand washing pose challenges for people with IDD. I'm expired. Many have underlying health conditions which exacerbate that susceptibility and they worsen as they age. At Premier, 80% of the patients with IDD have one or more chronic conditions that place them at high risk of severe illness from COVID. Hope will explain more about these vulnerabilities and existing medical resources available for this population. Hope. Um, Hope, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Levine. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Thanks, Peter. So um, my name is Hope Levy. I am the Executive Director of Premier Healthcare. Premier Healthcare is an Article 28 outpatient clinic. We have five locations within New York City, and we specialize in serving children and adults with developmental disabilities. We also serve everyone in our community. Uh, many of the areas are low-income, underserved areas. 95% of our patients are developmentally disabled. And as Peter mentioned, 80% of them have one or more chronic conditions that put them at high risk of severe COVID illness, conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. Um, Premier Healthcare has been open since the start of the pandemic. Our healthcare professionals have been on the front lines serving people nonstop. We have to date conducted 3,800 COVID tests for people in our community and the IDD population. Um, our medical staff and our nurses go out to the residential homes to help test individuals where there is risk of COVID spread. This help ensures that there is not continual spread and it also helps alleviate the stress that many of our patients have by coming to clinics and waiting long um, wait times in waiting rooms. What we have seen since November is an increase in positivity. From May until October, our positivity rate was at 1%. 
during the month of November, our positivity rate has now gone to 3%. We went to two residential homes last week to test the individuals living there and all of them tested positive, including three of their essential staff. As Peter mentioned, it is essential that people with developmental disabilities are in the phase one and identified at high risk of COVID infection. But what also is very, very important is that they can get these vaccinations at clinics and through their doctors that they are comfortable with. Premier is an Article 28 clinic and is on the central registry for immunization. However, to this date, we are unable to enroll as a vaccine provider. New York State and those providers outside of New York City have been able to work with the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities and are able to enroll as vaccine providers on the HCS registry. However, in New York City, providers that focus on the IDD population are unable to this time to register. And so we urge that clinics like Premier and other specialty clinics are allowed to get the vaccine in the early phases to really help with access because people with developmental disabilities need to trust where they're going. They need to be at ease with where they're vaccinated and they need to know who their healthcare professionals are. I wanna now turn this over to Margaret Puddington. Thank you very much. Margaret Puddington, uh, you may begin when ready. Time starts now. I am the mother of somebody with developmental disabilities and I would like to put a face on the data that you just heard. This is my son, Mark. He's 40 years old with a sunny, irresistible personality. He makes friends wherever he goes, despite his challenges. He has li limited cognitive abilities and he cannot speak, but communicates via sign language and has the most expressive face I have ever seen. He can't open a jar or cut his food or shave himself. And to remain safe, he needs staff with him every waking moment. Mark has just tasted, tested positive for COVID along with all of his housemates and one staff person in his group home in Washington Heights. Miraculously, all the housemates are asymptomatic so they do not need hospitalization. God bless the staff who are continuing to come in day after day putting their own health at risk. My greatest fear aside for Mark, aside from fatal infection, has been that if he got very sick he, and needed hospitalization, he would be totally alone without staff without me or his dad. That would be like sending your two-year-old to a hospital alone. Mark would never recover from such a terrifying experience. People with developmental disabilities who contract COVID are dying at three times the rate of the general population because many with DD have comorbidities and live in congregate care facilities. People in such facilities have a higher risk of contracting the virus because they interact daily with staff who assist them with intimate tasks requiring close contact, such as bathing and toothbrushing. Many with DD cannot tolerate masks, cannot comprehend the need to keep a safe distance or to refrain from shaking at hands or hugging. Staff come in shifts, so you have a large number of people in and out every day. And these people come by subway or bus and have families who may have risky professions. If a staff person working in a residence gets COVID, it's a sure bet that the others will catch it, just as in nursing homes. Now compare the risk of people, the risk level of people with DD with that of seniors like myself. I am 78 and have a heart condition. That makes me high risk. But I physically interact with no one except my husband. We go nowhere, no eating in restaurants, no visits with granddaughter or friends. We can control our risk. Mark cannot. People with DD should be top priority for vaccines right after frontline healthcare workers. Their risk is tremendous, as is the risk of their staff. In some respects, people with DD have a higher risk than those in nursing homes because people with DD have difficulty following safety protocols. For vaccine dissemination, I urge you to prioritize people with DD and their staff. I also urge you to ensure that people with DD can access vaccines through specialized Article 28 clinics, such as Premier Healthcare. We can't take Mark to Time our hospital. Expired. He is very fearful and would fight off that needle. Last year when he needed blood drawn, it required four separate visits to Quest, plus the support of both his favorite staff person and me. Hospitals don't have time to wait for Mark to comply. The Article 28 clinic he uses 
knows how to diffuse the experience for people like Mark. Article 28 must be a viable option for people with DD. Hope, Peter and I applaud New York City's efforts to prepare for a vaccine and to prioritize the most vulnerable populations. We urge that the IDD population, IDD specialty outpatient clinics and the clinical and direct support staff be included as priorities in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's the, the full panel, correct? Yes. My goodness, this was such uh, an important perspective that the three of you offered. And um, Ms. Puddington, thank you for sharing Mark's story. We will all be keeping him in our thoughts. Um, hope that he recovers swiftly. And uh, we certainly uh, stand with the Article 28 providers and saying you have to be able to deploy this vaccine, period. I am trying to square the comment of the commissioner who I, I assume you heard, I asked him directly uh, and he said, yes, our Article 28s will be part of the deployment plan, yet um, you're still not able to register in the system. Uh, do, do, do we presume this is just uh, a, uh, a tactical challenge that has to be overcome or, or do we fear there's a, a policy uh, inconsistency here? I think there might be a little bit of a disconnect. Um, when you talk to the state outside of New York City, providers can enroll. But because New York City is doing it on the cent central immunization registry, when we reach out to them, it, they say that it's by invite only and we have not been invited to enroll in New York City. So I know there was a mention of Gotham and there are some other large 28s. There are only three specialty 28s in New York City. That's Premier Healthcare and there are two others. To my knowledge, none of us are enrolled and able to um, plan for um, giving the vaccine. So I think there is a disconnect. Again, outside of New York City, we could enroll if we had a facility in Long Island or Westchester or Rockland, but in New York City, we right. cannot. Which, which makes no sense. So I do see that we have a representative from DOHMH still here um, and I'm hoping they're monitoring this discussion, but either way, we'll circle back to them and try and work out this discrepancy. Thank you all for speaking. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I don't see any other questions from council members, um, so we can move on to the next panel. And thank you again. Um, so we will turn to our next panel, which will include Jessica Orozco Gutland from the Hispanic Federation, Rebecca Talzik from Make the Road New York, and Ali Baum from the NYCLU. As a reminder, please wait to be told you may begin before starting and someone will unmute you once your name is called. And I wanna thank folks in advance for their patience. <clears throat> My meeting may take a moment or two. Um, so Jessica Orozco Gutman, you may begin. Time starts now. Sorry. Hello, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Hello. Hear you. Oh, hi. Hello everyone. I'm sorry, I was giving my children lunch and paying attention to this at the same time. Um, I'm Jessica Orozco Gutline. I'm Chief of Staff at Hispanic Federation. Um, I will be developing the testimony or uh, giving the testimony on behalf of Frankie Miranda, President and CEO of Hispanic Federation. Um, thanks to Chairman, Chairwoman Rivera and Chairman Levine for, and all the committee members for bringing us here together today. Um, we're going to submit the, um, written testimony online, but for the for this portion, I'm gonna be succinct <clears throat> um, and summarize our testimony. Uh, two major components of an effective distribution, distribution plan are working in partnership with trusted institutions rooted in community and ensuring that anyone can get vac vaccinated regardless of cost. So, you know, the New York City distribution proposal, as you know, many folks have testified earlier, talk about partner engagement, but we really, really need to ensure that this is intentional and a definitive goal of the vaccine task force. You know, our community, the Latino community, communities of color have been ravaged by this pandemic. And we need to ensure that community-based institutions are working hand in hand with any institution or agency leading this effort because our nonprofits are rooted in community and we're deeply embedded in our neighborhoods that provide the frontline healthcare and human services to millions of Latinos. They're listening to us, they're counting on us and they're saying, is this okay? 
right? Can I get vaccinated? Is this gonna be safe for me and my family? <clears throat> and as mentioned before as well, mistrust within communities of color regarding vaccines administered by the government are rooted in our history with people of color being used without authorization as guinea pigs for vaccinations and medical experimentation, including sterilization. And while these concerns are legitimate, we must work to dispel many myths that can lead to vulnerable community members refusing to get vaccinated. Community education campaigns must include collaboration and leadership by trusted healthcare providers and community partners. It's imperative that private and public agencies are included to develop this culturally and linguistically competent strategy to build trust and increase acceptance for demand, um, acceptance and demand for vaccinations. And our agency should target investments in our community-based organizations uh, for transparent responses to concerns around the distribution and safety of the vaccine. Um, community-based organizations can also be essential to, um, to ensure that individuals receive the two-dose vaccine requirement. And unfortunately, as we talked about before, the federal distribution plan are, is asking governors to sign agreements that would provide sensitive information to the federal, uh, federal agencies. We, we understand this need to follow up with individuals, but we know for a fact that there, there's, a way to <clears throat> there's a way to collect this information that does not put people at risk of deportation. Hispanic Federation has actually had experience in distributing funds to vulnerable community oh, members, oh. Um, including funds to undocumented immigrants affected by the 9-11 attacks, uh, the victims of Flight 587 and undocumented community members affected by Hurricane Sandy and rebuilding. And we were able to distribute these funds, collect information, identifiable information, while keeping these folks safe from deportation. And we also signed on to the governor's letter um, calling for a distribution plan that did not have sensitive information. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Rebecca Talzak from Make the Road New York. Time starts now. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Becca Telzak. I'm the Director of Health Programs at Make the Road New York. I want to thank the Committee on Health and the Committee on Hospitals and the Council members here today for the opportunity to comment. The communities we serve at Make the Road are among the hardest hit by this crisis. Our largest base is in Central Queens, the epicenter of the epicenter, where Elmer's Hospital has been in the national spotlight, heroically trying, even with diminishing resources, to save some of the most impacted community members. While the city moves forward with developing a vaccination plan, we want to ensure the following. The vaccine needs to be accessible to everyone, especially low-income and immigrant communities, ensure clear privacy protections are in place so that individual data is not shared with other federal agencies, including law, law enforcement and ICE. Um, and thirdly, that the city should partner with trusted community-based organizations, like we just heard, um, to conduct outreach and education about the vaccine. Uh, we need a responsible public health approach that, um, to make sure that impacted communities are at the forefront of these solutions. Um, in terms of accessibility, the vaccine distribution plan already disadvantages, that's coming from the federal level, disadvantages low-income communities, um, many of which were hardest hit by the pandemic um, in the way that it's prioritizing private pharmacies, hospitals, and certain clinics. Um, it's essential that everyone have access to this vaccine and that everyone feels safe uh, doing so. Therefore, there should be a more inclusive distribution plan that includes the public hospital system, health clinics, community schools, and other community settings. Um, and places where low-income immigrant communities go for healthcare and services. Um, additionally, as we heard earlier, the definition of who gets a vaccine in the initial round should be expanded to include all essential workers and including workers such as delivery workers in that definition. Um, in terms of privacy, the data sharing agreement that the federal government has asked states to sign allows HHS to share personally identified information about vaccine recipients with any other federal agency, which could include law enforcement and ICE. This is horrific and will cause many people in the communities most affected by the virus, including black, brown and immigrant communities from getting vaccinated. Um, many individuals won't participate in, in, in this vaccine program because of that. Um, there should be clear privacy protections in place to ensure that information is not getting shared with agencies other than healthcare agencies and is not used for any other purpose. Um, and then finally, for partnership with community-based organizations and education, in order to get through this crisis, it's essential that vaccines are accessible to everyone at no cost. They must be available during evening and weekends uh, to accommodate those who are working essential jobs. Um, and everything obviously must be translated into, into multiple languages and accessible. And the city should partner with trusted community-based organizations to do outreach to high-risk communities to ensure they are aware of the vaccination options available to them and how to access them. Um, community-based organizations provided resources to educate community members on the importance of getting vaccines and help answer any questions or concerns. 
Immigrant communities in particular who lack health insurance are often concerned that getting vaccinated could be considered a public charge and are fear fearful that it may impact their ability to get a green card and are also concerned that they'll be left uh, with debilitating medical debt. So trusted community organizations and immigrant communities can play an essential role in mitigating these fears and oh, making sure communities have access to accurate information and resources. Thank you again for the opportunity today. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now turn to Ali Baum. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My written statement focuses on three important issues, vaccine confidentiality, vaccine distribution mechanisms, and equitable, culturally competent vaccine distribution. In the interest of time and to not retread too much ground that my co-panelists covered so well, I'm going to focus my oral testimony primarily on vaccine confidentiality. But I do want to make one quick point about vaccine distribution. The federal government, as you know, has announced that it will use the traditional private health infrastructure to distribute COVID-19 vaccines. This means, as you know, the major pharmacy chains, doctor's offices, and hospitals. Unfortunately, the traditional private health in infrastructure does not serve all communities equally. And this distribution mechanism threatens to leave out the very communities that have been most impacted by the pandemic. To put a finer point on it, while there are 100 traditional vaccination sites in Manhattan, north of Chinatown and south of 37th Street, there is only one vaccination site in East Elmhurst. City Council must ensure that the vaccine reaches all of our communities. Unfortunately, the distribution mechanism is not the only mistake the federal government has made when it comes to vaccines. It is conditioning, as you've heard, distribution of any COVID-19 vaccine to a state on that state signing a data sharing agreement that commits to provide the federal government with a wealth of personal information about each vaccine recipient, including but not limited to name, address, date of birth, and identification number. Typically, the CDC does not collect identifiable information from states full stop. This is true when it comes to information to inform the federal government's response to the other pandemic we faced in our lifetimes, the National HIV Surveillance Program. What's more, the, state, the data sharing agreement is explicit that the CDC can share vaccine information with quote unquote other federal partners, which could include ICE, the FBI, or DHS. This is also unprecedented. Any number of people will likely be chilled from receiving vaccines if they believe their personal information will be shared broadly within the federal government. This is particularly true for black, brown, and immigrant communities who, because of a toxic cocktail, of socioeconomic factors, physical environment, and inferior access to healthcare are disproportionately likely to suffer from COVID-19. They're also disproportionately likely, as you've heard over and over and said today, to be alienated from and distrustful of our healthcare system because of the racial biases that pervade that system. This is also true of religious enclaves, such as the Hasidic community, which has also been ravaged by COVID-19 and still harbors deep distrust of the public health system. While council members must tread carefully to avoid exacerbating any chilling effect, the city council must do everything it can, including reevaluating and strengthening where necessary the protections for the citywide immunization registry. It also includes pressuring state and federal lawmakers to ensure that New York does not share troves of vaccine personal information with the federal government and that where information is shared, it remains with the federal health agencies. Personal information shared to respond to a public health crisis should not be used to criminalize or deport people. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. That really was uh, uh, an excellent panel with critical points, challenges which are going to be more difficult because we need to have people come back for a second dose and therefore this really couldn't be done anonymously. You need to not just track uh, whether a patient returns, but you presumably need to contact them as a reminder. Um, so you're probably gonna wanna get a cell number. And I know that makes the challenges that you all spoke about um, even more difficult. Uh, and I, I wonder if any of you have thoughts on how we can both collect the information that we need, but um, not in any way lose the confidence of, of vulnerable members of the public. So please, Ali. Oh. Sorry, the muting and unmuting is a little awkward, but uh, there you go. I figured if I flailed enough, someone would unmute me. 
Um, you know, I think the challenge is you're absolutely right. We do have to collect information about people who are vaccinated. But then it's a question of where that information goes and who it is shared with. And so, you know, part of it is collecting it and making sure it remains with the city or where necessary with the state and that we're not sharing identifiable information with the federal government. And to the extent that we are, that they're locking it down within the health agencies. And there are ways, there's a protocol called privacy preserving uh, record linkages that allows, and, the, and it's used frequently within some of things like our immunization um, information systems at the state level. And uh, I, I don't know whether it's used with the citywide reg registry, it could be, um, where a provider would put in information and someone would be able to get information to say, I got my first vaccine in New York City and then moved somewhere and the provider in the other place needed to find out if I had been vaccinated and which vaccine and stuff. They could put in the information they had about me to get my information back out of the system but what's actually shared between jurisdictions, what you can get if you don't have the information about the person in front of you is very, very limited. And so again, it's about using the technologies we have. It's about locking down information, making sure it's not going to people who don't need it. Um, and it's also about you making sure that the folks who are collecting this information on the first end and are engaging in the vaccination process are the folks community members trust. You know, I think as my co-panelist said so persuasively, the reaction to someone from Hispanic Federation asking you for a cell number so that they can follow up and make sure you get your second vaccine is probably really different from the reaction to a provider you don't know where you don't know where all that cell phone, where that cell phone information is going to go and where that information is going to go more generally. And just to add on that point, we just concluded a successful, um, you know, census right through, of course, council members' offices where we were collecting information from undocumented community members, but we had Title 13, right, to protect us. And so again, these protections need to be in place so that way our community members, and that was one of our talking points in English and Spanish culturally competent, um, you know, messengers stay stating that this is protected information, you are safe. Um, and so that was a huge talking point. We ran focus groups and just having a law to protect this information really swayed people and these focus groups had undocumented community members on providing uh, identifiable information. Thank you. And Emily, I'll pass it back to you. I think we have some questions. Uh, yes, so uh, thank you so much for your testimony. I see that we have a, a question from council member Rosenthal and I just wanna again, remind any council members present, if you have a question to please use the Zoom raise hand function. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, you may begin questioning when you're ready. Thanks, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. And, and my question really is along the same line as Chair Levine. I'm wondering uh, to this panel of experts on, um, you know, who, who understand, who are culturally competent about their own communities, um, how do we message that the vaccine is safe and you should take it? Um, you know, especially for communities who have been historically screwed by people saying that to them. Um, and um, I'm hoping you'll also give ideas about how there could be peer-to-peer -peer work on this, how to integrate that peer-to-peer -peer work in uh, maybe the medical system that will be giving out the vaccine or, I, I don't know. I would, I, this is Becca from Make the Road. I mean, I agree with everything that my colleagues, uh, Ali and Jessica said earlier um, in response to the question. I think we, you know, I think the first step is really what Ali was describing of just making sure that we are having the right protections in place because it's really hard for groups like us to convince people to get vaccinated if we're, if, if we aren't confident that the data is not getting shared um, to other um, federal agencies, right? So I feel like the first step is really doing that data security piece. Then from there, like the biggest thing in terms of messaging is really who the messenger is, right? And so like we were hearing earlier, just making sure that the folks who are actually communicating um, to community members are from similar communities and understand and you know have been through kind of similar experiences. And so I know we often at Make the Road use kind of a promotorda model, which is a peer educator model. There's community health workers 
um, models as well, which are really successful at disseminating information. Um, many community health workers are kind of embedded in healthcare institutions, but really partner closely with community organizations. So really understand kind of the health, the public health needs in the moment, but are also coming from the community-based side of things and really are able to connect and relate to, um, to community members and have that level of trust, which I think is so essential to be able to make sure that we are kind of implementing a successful uh, vaccination plan. Yeah, and Rebecca, to the point I think you made earlier, or maybe Jessica made it about um, uh, successes in, in doing census work, um, are there lessons learned for the city given that, I mean, our response rate was good, but it was still, what, 65%? Um, so that's not good. Um, are there lessons learned for what the city could have been doing better? Not necessarily asking that you say here they are, but you know, some sort of roadmap, I think giving that to the city would be incredibly helpful. Sure. So in terms of lessons learned, like, like you said before, of course, we wish it would have been higher than 65%. But here you obviously, uh, you know, as mentioned numerous times, Latinos and Blacks and communities of color are disproportionately by high numbers affected, right? And so I think people have stated there's absolutely no excuse to say, wait, let's think about this now, right? The doctors have stated, you know, ha have to have thought about this. Um, we, we have to know this, right? Um, our CBOs were telling us this weeks before it was published in the Times and weeks before the data was out that we knew that our community was suffering disproportionately. And so learning from the census outreach here at the same time, you have, you know, census is clearly just providing information. Here you have a tangible, then you're gonna get this vaccine, right? So I believe that just with that, that 65% number I think is promising. Um, but again, you had those protections in place that, you know, my colleagues Rebecca and really, really are harping on. Um, and then the Promotora model, that is one, of course, that across the board uses, I'm in your community, I live by you, I work by you, I'm, you know, talk to me, I speak your language, our, our kids go to school together, like, let's do this, right? We also had to shift with COVID into, te into technology. So we do text messaging, peer-to-peer -peer text messaging, media campaigns, phone calls, which people are answering the phone now more than ever um, because they're home. Um, and, uh, and all of that, you know, that technology also came into play and to reach out to our community members as well. And Thank I wanna, you all. Oh, sure. I wanna just piggyback very quickly and highlight something Jessica and Becca have both said. From the census, we have the strongest privacy protections for census information. Census information is totally locked down. It cannot be shared with law enforcement. It cannot be shared with ICE. It cannot be used against you in court. It cannot be used against you in an administrative proceeding. It's inadmissible. We need to have that, those sorts of protections for the sharing of our public health information. And right now we don't. Um, we have a lot of good protections, but right now someone who does have access to our immunization records can share that when they think that it's in the best interest not only of the person to whom the information pertains, but of other people. Yeah. And you know, that's another area where building in some legislative protections and statutory protections would be really helpful. And those are at the state and federal level or are there any at the city level? And you just, Allie, need to be unmuted. I feel your pain. If we could unmute um, Allie Bohm. I'm sorry, I'm so good at muting myself after I talk so that I don't have background noise. Um, so the answer is those protections exist at the state level. They also exist at the city level. Um, so I'm- So the rolling. concern is the federal level protection. The concern is actually no, the concern is we need to tighten both our state law and our city law oh. because the immunization registries are at the state level and at the city level. And one thing that I wanna highlight while I'm talking is the federal information sharing agreement that we've all talked about explicitly says in it, we the federal government are requiring you to send identifiable information to us unless you have a law saying that you will only share de-identified information. And so that creates space for us both at the state level and at the city level because the city does run its own immunization uh, registry to put in place some of those statutory protections. And I'm happy to talk with members about where that lives in the law and what it might look like. Great. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, uh, chairs.
Great, and seeing no other questions, um, we will now turn to our final panel. I wanna thank this panel again for your testimony. Um, so we will turn to our final panel. Let me just pull up the names. Um, our final panel will include Man Yuck Yu, Marie Mangian, Kelly Sabatino, and Jesse Soul. Um, I just want to remind folks that um, I want to thank everyone for their patience. Uh, we will be unmuted once I say your name, and it may take a few moments. Um, and as a reminder, uh, you may begin uh, before you start. Um, the sergeant will, will say that you can begin. So our next panelist is Manyak Yu, and uh, you can begin when ready. Thank you. You begin. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Manyak Yu, Executive Vice President at the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services. AMS is a not-for-profit healthcare organization in Sunset Park that provides free health services integrated with individualized health education and social services in the populations of New York City. Our mission is to deinstitutionalize healthcare and make it a basic human right for all New Yorkers. I'm here today to call for a vaccine strategy that is culturally responsive and elevates community organizations as critical players in vaccine delivery. We anticipate that vaccine hesitancy will be a major challenge in Sunset Park and many other communities of color. Many in our community have a deep-seated mistrust of institutionalized healthcare settings and have been long underrepresented in clinical trials. Medical researchers in the US have also taken terrible advantage of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, including Asian and Pacific Islander and Latinx communities. This is a complicated and divisive issue because vaccination should not be an option, but it is a matter of life and death. However, calls for mandatory vaccination will create resistance. We have seen mask wearing and social distancing guidelines politicized, whereas over-enforcement has also led to mistreatment of brown, Black and brown individuals. One thing that we know for certain is that COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic has proven the need for transparency to inspire the public's trust. Culturally competent messaging to immigrant communities about the importance of vaccination, where to vaccinate, and the current status of vaccination efforts are all essential to this effort. Every culture community has different reasons for vaccine hesitancy. We have already heard from people we work with who are afraid to receive the vaccine because they are distrustful of the effectiveness of vaccine research. They don't want their children to get that vaccine, even if it's available. They're afraid that going to out to get that vaccine will get them sick. As a personal anecdote, my grandmother is going blind now because our family have been hesitant to take her to receive critical health services from her ophthalmologist during COVID-19. We need to determine a safe and secure way to get vaccines to home to homebound individuals. We must also remember that in 2019, the measles outbreak in South Brooklyn was met with resistance from many people in the Hasidic community, requiring on the ground and culturally competent outreach. Misinformation is also rampant across social networking platforms like WeChat in the Chinese communities, um, indicating the, um, the ineffectiveness of upcoming vaccinations. New York City must invest resources in tailoring messages based on learning from each community rather than targeting communities of color as one block in its vaccine delivery strategy. In order to effectively reach all New Yorkers, nonprofits, community organizations like AMS, which have already been involved in test and trace advisory efforts, should also be prioritized as central partners in vaccine distribution and education. These must be funded efforts supported with up-to-date information from, the health, from our uh, healthcare agencies. These must be funded. Uh, the people that we work with have historically been underserved by healthcare oh, that are foundational to the federal government's vaccine distribution strategy. While flu vaccines are offered for free through health and hospitals, there were no sites local to Sunset Park and neighboring hospitals to administer the vaccination. Over the season, our organization had to contact and partner with multiple pharmacies, offer over 400 vaccinations to open spaces, and there is even higher demand now. We need local institutions that actively offer the vaccine, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine for free once available to uninsured community members in order to fully reach the, the unmet need. Without trusted messengers to champion uh, the vaccine, we fear that the most needed communities, um, that the most needy in our communities will go unprotected. Um, with COVID-19 cases rising in this country, this is not the time to ignore this vulnerable population, but to support them. 
And healthcare, we want to, again, emphasize that healthcare is not privilege, but a basic human right. And we strongly urge that the mayor and city councils consider supporting a community-based and culturally sensitive vaccine delivery strategy in solidarity with our immigrant neighbors and to promote a city that is committed to equal opportunity, social justice, and health equity. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you so much for your testimony. And we are now going to turn to Marie Mangian. Uh, Marie, you may begin when ready. You may begin. Great. Thank you to the council and the chairs for convening this hearing today. My name is Marie Manjan and I'm the director of policy with Chicanies and we're the statewide association for community health centers, also known as federally qualified health centers or FQHCs. I'm really pleased to be here to talk about the rollout of an equitable and safe vaccine distribution process in New York City for all New Yorkers. Our health centers serve 1.3 million New Yorkers annually, many of whom without our services wouldn't benefit from primary and preventive care at all. Recently, we surveyed our members on anticipated vaccine acceptability amongst their patients and their staff. We found that most health centers reported that the newness of the COVID-19 vaccine, coupled with an information vacuum where patients and providers don't feel informed about vaccination creation and distribution plans, are both contributing to vaccine hesitancy. We urge the city to collaborate with New York's health centers and FQHC network in any government sponsored education and outreach efforts to help confirm for our patients and the medical community that they trust and rely on not only endorses the vaccine, but is available to assist with that access. We praise the council's efforts to ensure that vaccine distribution is um, anti-racist and distri distributed through an intersectional lens. And we applaud DOHMH for stressing in its vaccination plan the importance of equitable vaccine distribution for communities most at risk for severe health complications due to COVID. We're thankful especially that DOHMH recognized the important role of health centers in its distribution plan. Our health centers can be quickly deployed to provide wide access to the COVID-19 vaccine, and we want to provide that access. We wanna help educate our communities, largely communities of color in the city, on the vaccine's safety and efficacy, thereby increasing vaccination rates in those hard to reach communities. But for that program to be successful, it's going to require partnership between DOHMH and uh, the city council and the health centers. We must ensure continued access to PPE for all patient facing staff. And we need support for some of the other vaccine distribution items as well. In that recent Shikini survey, we found that 85% of health centers don't have access to any kind of ultra cold storage systems that are required for some of the vaccines. Distributing those vaccines to health center patients is going to require really close communication between DOHMH and the health center network. We continue to welcome the opportunity uh, to participate in any pre-distribution planning sessions conducted by the council or DOHMH. And we wanna work as partners with you to ensure that all New Yorkers who want to receive the vaccine are able to do so in the neighborhoods and communities where they live. Thank you so much for having me here today and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now turn to our next panelist. Um, our next panelist is Kelly Sabatino. Kelly Sabatino, uh, you are gonna be called on next. And you may begin, thank you. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, my name is Kelly Sabatino. I'm the Public Policy Manager at Community Healthcare Network. We are an FQHC or Federally Qualified Health Center with locations throughout Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. And rather than kind of reading my uh, testimony verbatim, I'll just focus on our main argument today, which is highlighting what m many other testifiers said before that the COVID vaccine provides an opportunity for the city and the healthcare system and all the other CBOs to make sure that black and brown communities are not left behind. Um, the disparities that we're seeing in COVID infection rates in these communities just highlight long-term systemic raci racism um, and the factors that it affects um, and, you know, historic mistrust of the healthcare system, lack of multicultural and multilingual communications, a predominantly black and Latinx essential workforce all serve to increase the burden of exposure and disease and death among communities of color. So um, in 
Last spring, in the first wave of COVID, uh, CHN partnered with the state and the First Presbyterian Church of Jamaica in Jamaica, Queens, to conduct a COVID-19 testing site for a couple months. And based on that experience, we recommend to the city looking into opportunities to collaborate with other churches and religious institutions within historically underserved communities. Our collaboration with the church in Jamaica was invaluable increase in increasing COVID-19 testing rates among black and brown families, reinforcing our understanding that communities are more motivated to engage in the healthcare system or a certain healthcare practice when it is endorsed by trusted leaders and institution with their community. We also recommend that the city explore partnerships with local community groups to amplify messaging and outreach. In our example, we also partnered with Queen's Power, which is a grassroots uh, coalition focused on creating positive change within their community. And that was successful in um, continuing to help connect families to critical healthcare resources. Um, again, the focus is really ensuring that the vaccine is distributed equi equitably among uh, New Yorkers and working to um, get to the root of issues that might impact uh, individuals hesitance to receive the vaccine. I think the latest data shows that a significant portion of the Black and Latinx community is hesitant to receive the vaccine even if it's paid for. So um, this just serves as an impetus to make sure that we are closing that health gap um, through communication and access to care. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now turn to Jesse Soule. Hi, I'm Jesse Saul. I'm testifying as a civilian, have not done this before. Thank you all for your time and your hard work guiding the city through the pandemic. Um, many people on, on this Zoom have spoken to this, but I wanna further emphasize the need to start planning communications um, and campaigns around the vaccine now. While I understand distribution is an enormous challenge, it is extremely important to have a creative, customized and aggressive communication plan aggressive communications plan to encourage vaccinations and fight disinformation, and it doesn't sound like much is in place at this time. It's my understanding that adoption of the COVID tracker app, which I know is largely a state initiative, is only around 5% of the population and only 900 people have tested positive and entered their code in the app total. That's a fraction of daily positive cases. I believe around 30% of 18 to 49 year olds get flu shots. Um, and while the resources and logistics involved in the city's efforts are incredible, when it comes to communicating these efforts in a way that drives a critical mass of participation, it seems there's a lot more that can be done to consider new approaches. There is unfortunately a massive problem with trust in public officials at this time. I feel it's important to work more with local media with a diverse strategy to encourage vaccination in a way that's creative, it comes from voices that reach a wider range of New Yorkers. For example, Chicago, uh, Chicago Public Health just worked with important members of the local music scene to reach millennials and in particular millennials of color in targeted neighborhoods aligned with those personalities to encourage flu vaccinations. It's the type of creative planning that we need to adopt to increase vaccinations across communities that are harder to reach and don't pay attention to city channels. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I would love to continue this conversation and share ideas if anyone here is interested. Thank you, and Emily, that's uh, that's our full panel, correct? Um, well, I, I just want to say that that the community healthcare providers are going to have to have a massive role in this vaccination program. There's just there's no group that's better positioned because you're already embedded in communities, you've built trust, you have the relationships, you have multilingual staff, cultural competency, um, and we thank you for speaking up today. Uh, I just want to ask whether um, any of your organizations have attempted to, and I apologize for the background noise, working from home, uh, whether any of you have attempted to register in the city's um, IT system for the vaccination, uh, and whether you've been successful or whether you've encountered some of the problems that, that our previous panels um, reported. Um. Uh, Kelly Sabatino from CHN. Uh, we have not, uh, I don't believe we've attempted to register in the city system. We did just submit an application to the CDC to receive vaccines. And we are at this moment coming up with a plan on how to best do this um, based on what is available to us and the shipping and all the operational logistics. This is Manyak from the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services. We have not registered in the IT system. Um, 
nor have we received, nor have we registered with the CDC. I don't think there's been proper communication with community-based organizations on how to do so. Um, so we would certainly appreciate uh, DOH and major health and hospital sharing that information with us. And I'll just add um, on behalf of the rest of the health centers, I can't say for certain um, whether or not health centers have registered. However, I can say that DOHMH has been working closely with us. We held an enrollment webinar for all of our city providers. They were provided with instructions on how to enroll. Um, I have not been made aware of any issues with that enrollment to date. Um, that of course doesn't guarantee that there are none, but I, I will say that we've been in close communication with DOHMH uh, in recent weeks about this. That's good. Obviously let us know if there are barriers that emerge. At a minimum, it seems like the city has to do a better job of communicating to all the local centers about how to enroll. And obviously the time to work that out is now before we're in the midst of distributing the vaccine. So we're, we're, we're happy to work with you on that. Thank you. Great. Um, so seeing no other questions, um, I will now see if we may have inadvertently missed anybody. Um, so thanks So thanks to everyone from this panel for your testimony, and we appreciate everyone's time. Um, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function now, and we will call you in the order in which your hand is raised. Okay, great. So um, seeing no hands. I will now turn it back to Chair Levine for any closing remarks. We have concluded the public testimony for the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is just such an important hearing and so informative. First, I want to thank Chair Rivera. It's always wonderful to partner with you. And thanks for everything you've done throughout this pandemic um, and for your work on the issue of vaccination. And uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, this is uh, a time of split screen news for New York City, where uh, on the one hand, uh, we're facing um, a very severe second wave. And on the other hand, we have enormous hope in the vaccination now um, appearing to be potentially beginning in less than two weeks. And we've got to work on both fronts simultaneously. Um, and uh, we don't want to be distracted from either fight. But today was an important discussion on what really is our, our long-term hope at getting beyond this pandemic. And uh, I wanna thank everyone who contributed their voices uh, in the administration and in the public. And I'll pass it to you, Chair Rivera, for any final words. I just wanna thank all the panelists and the administration, and of course, our team at the council for making this happen, every single one of you. I know we have a lot of questions as to how we reach the homebound the homeless and the group housed. And so we're looking forward to those answers and as much transparency as possible from health and hospitals and DOH. And of course, utilizing the relationships built by our community-based organizations, but fully supporting that those actions and that implementation, just like we did with the census and voter outreach we trust you all to um, be able to have those frank conversations. And so we certainly owe you details, answers, and statistics, and of course, a plan as to how we roll out um, millions of vaccines ultimately. So thank you, Chair Levine. Thank you to our team. Um, and I am looking forward to making sure that we do this the right way and as quickly as possible. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Emily, do you have any announcements before we wrap up? Excellent. No, I think we're ready to conclude. Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. This concludes our hearing. Be safe.